Good evening, Wakefield, um, and welcome to this special school committee meeting on this Tuesday, August 4th, 2020. I'd like to call this meeting to order and note that a small group of us are in studio social distancing, uh, but this is a virtual meeting via Zoom and broadcast on WCAT's Facebook Live page. I'd like to start the meeting off with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next, I'd like to read the mission statement. The vision of the Wakefield Public Schools <coughs> is to graduate students who are confident, lifelong learners who are respectful and caring members of their community. Our mission is to prepare students for college, career, and community by providing rich and challenging curriculum, high quality instruction, and educational experiences that meet their individual needs and interests. Um, the purpose of this meeting is for Superintendent Lyons to provide information for Wakefield's reopening plans. Per the agenda, the presentation will include a review of the preliminary reopening plans to, uh, the district has submitted to DESE. Um, a review of the summary sent to parents and teachers, and a review of the reopening teamwork at each level. And lastly, the district's recommended preliminary reopening calendar and model. With permission from this body, I would like to suggest that we hold our questions and comments until Superintendent Lyons is, uh, completes each presentation, and you will see that in the slides as well. Um, and with that, I'd just like to hand it off to Superintendent Lyons. Good evening. It's nice to be in studio. Uh, it makes us feel like we're, we're getting closer to getting back to school, so it, it feels pretty good. And we're here socially distanced or from one another, um, obviously taking precautions as well. So, so thank you very much for joining us. So we have a slideshow this evening um, that will be posted on our website after um, our show this evening. Um, we are also will post uh, the report the preliminary report that we sent out earlier today, which describes our schedules at each level and describes the work of the reopening team. And so um, I'd like to start off just by talking about, you know, context setting. And so it, it's really critical for us not to lose sight of the fact that Massachusetts is still in a state of emergency and has really done an exceptional job taking safety precautions, wearing masks, participating in hand washing and hand hygiene, um, and being as socially distant as people can be from one another. Um, it really um, shows in terms of our community transmission data, um, and it, it really shows here in Wakefield. And so our, our latest data in our last few weeks, we are below 1%, right, 1% kind of transmission rate, which is really exceptional um, overall in the state. But in, in regard to setting the context, I, I just want to be clear that, you know, safety is our first priority and, and reopening schools in a way where we're taking safety precautions and adults will be provided pr protective gear um, and students will be wearing masks as well. And there'll be more detailed information on that as we move through our plans. But people being well, um, and, and as we prepare to return, you know, we have the important role and everyone has a hand um, and a role to play in making sure that we keep not only ourselves safe, but keep each other safe, right? And so we'll talk a, a little bit about that. You know, other factors to consider in regard to the information that we're presenting this evening. So one of the things that we've learned in being in a remote model this past spring is that you know, we, we did a good job this past spring, um, but there were some shortfalls that we had uh, with a lot of students. You know, some students at different levels had a great deal of difficulty participating in, in remote learning, and we've learned quite a bit from doing that this past spring, um, and, and which is, leads us to, this, to the point that there's really no substitute for in-person instruction, right? It's not only the learning that takes place and the instruction that takes place, um, but there's also the social benefit of students being with one another, learning with one another, and being in relationships with one another. Um, and 
and students have been apart, and the social isolation um, that has been caused from this pandemic has been significant. It's been significant not only for our students, and it has affected them significantly, but it has also affected our, our teachers, our faculty, and our staff as well. And so those are just some things that you know, we feel is important to kind of bring up in regard to setting a context before we get into uh, the reopening work that we've been assigned to do by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, but also to kind of share just some idea that we acknowledge the fact that there is no substitute for in-person instruction. And so one of the things that we're thinking a lot about is educational equity, right? And we've talked about equity uh, almost as a core value um, in everything that we do. You know, the, the equity has come up in this past spring um, when we've discussed issues about racism um, and how people are perceived and how people are treating one another. We've talked about equity in terms of goal setting. We've also talked about equity in, ter in terms of not just the redistribution of resources, um, but equity in regard to outcomes for kids, right? We need to be attentive to really thinking about you know, equity not just as a redistribution of resources in that some populations of students need more support or more resources, but we need to think about what achievement means for those students. And at the heart of all of that is we know that when we discuss this premise, we know that we need to have relationships with students um, and families. And so, for example, in thinking about remote instruction um, and the possibility of having part of a hybrid model or part or moving into a remote model, um, we're really challenged by the idea of engaging students in a remote model without having relationships with them, right? So we know, for example, our kindergartners um, haven't even been in our schools. Our teachers have yet to meet those students. Um, and we could potentially be working with them in a remote situation where we need to really think about how we might structure that so that we can make relationships first, um, not only with our kindergartners, but with all of our students before we're engaging them in teaching and learning. And so um, I shared here a link to Richard Milner's work um, that really talks about um, equity as, as an outcome and not within a framework. Um, and we'll share more about that as we move into the spring. The objectives for this evening are to describe our reopening team process and to share the three plans that we created, that we were assigned to create at the Department of Education, to share staff and parent survey data we're gonna share the, the plans that we created and the feasibility of executing each plan. Um, and then we're gonna end with a final recommendation. Um, we know that there's no perfect plan. I wanna say that right up front. With every plan that we've worked to create, we know that there are challenges um, and, and there are also positives of, of each. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about outlining safety protocols and preparation and the additional planning considerations that we need to continue to make as we move into August. So at the bottom of our next slide, you'll see a continuum for reopening models. Um, in early June, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the Commissioner of Education, Jeff Riley, asked all superintendents and all administrative teams to create three models and in creating those three models to assess the feasibility of doing, of executing each model. Um, they have asked us, when I say they, uh, state leaders have asked us to really give some serious thought to this idea that if we are reopening the economy and public health data will allow and it keeps moving in a positive direction, that we as school leaders have a responsibility to really, really push hard to do the best we can to try to get kids back to school, right? And so, and again, there are some variables there that we need to work through. Um, obviously, we need to kind of work with all of our stakeholders, our families, 
um, as well as our bargaining units um, to make sure that we answer all questions and that there's an understanding and expectation, um, again, no matter what plan we move into, that it will serve students as well as we can under the circumstances. So one of the first things we've done is we've built teams at, at every school, um, and there's representation on those school-based teams. We have teachers, nurses, um, I think we have a few counselors on some of those teams, and we also have a district-level team as well. And so we've been convening weekly with the Wakefield Education Association uh, leaders meeting uh, to talk to them about reopening. Um, a number of those leaders are on reopening teams at the high school and at the district level. Um, and so we've been having weekly meetings that are scheduled for us to really work through each one of these plans and to talk about what might be the best fit for us or what might be the best way for us to start school here in the fall. And so I don't know if at this point before, Mike, you already have a question. I sure do. What yeah, you, Doug, one question I had, and I looked through the teams from the various schools, and it seemed to be a good cross uh, population of teachers, administration, et cetera. The one thing I noted as an exception in all the teams is there were no parents. Now, I understand some teachers are parents and some administrative people are also parents, but uh, was there a reason why you didn't include people who were, for lack of a better term, just parents on the committees? So these are preliminary <laughs> plans, Mike. Mm -hmm. And so, and in the preliminary planning stage, we thought um, because there was a short turnaround time that we thought that we could create three, three plans um, and then get those working drafts or the plan that we recommended, get that working draft out to the community and get feedback on that, which is what we sent out today, Mike. Yep, okay. Right? Thank and you. so yep. that's, that's where we're at there. So we have over, um, I, I didn't do a head count, Mike, but I believe we have over 80 teacher leaders and administrators that are participating on these teams. Um, and I wanna say we have at least teachers that are also parents, we probably have at least 10 in the group. Um, so, you know, and, and one of the things that we're also, I also learned early on as an administrator is that there's really no secrets in what we're doing here. Um, you know, our recommendations and the work that we're doing are really um, because we are, the teams are so large um, that, that a lot of people are in the know. But more people we will be in the know this week with the information that we've released. And we've also scheduled follow-up Zoom meetings with different groups, elementary parents, middle school parents, and high school parents to follow up as well. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions from the group? No, Amy, you have a question? So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so I can jump right in. Uh, the next piece of our presentation is to summarize the surveys that we had issued out early on in the process. One of the first things that we did was to send surveys to both parents and staff and um, we included in our staff survey um, all components of the district teachers um, and, and all faculty and staff who work within our buildings um, so this page just really summarize who, summarizes who responded at each of the schools and a breakdown of who is who so we can keep going to the next slide so um oh, can you just comment on the parent participation or the participation that we're at? Sure, yeah, so just in terms of total respondents, it really, you know, we had we had a high um, rate of, of respondents uh, across, we, we kept the survey open for about two weeks. And for faculty and staff within the district, we had 469 respon responses, and for parents and families, we had 2,744 responses across the district. The next slide just touches on some of the successes that were highlighted through the survey data, and the way we're looking at this is it's really, helping us to to improve our our remote learning process because i think a lot of the feedback came from the spring when we were in a rem remote model so i think the su successes were really what people put forward in terms of what worked 
and you know I won't go through all the the bullets, but I think the gist of it is that I think there was um, success in having um, some of our teachers have a comfort level with remote learning, having had the Learn Anywhere uh, program in play. Um, the communication piece was huge. Um, I think parents and staff felt better when they were interacting live with students and um, being able to, to, to teach students over Zoom or Google Meet and um, give that kind of feedback and have that, um, that time directly with them. And um, we also talked, you know, when it was possible. Um, and again, I think consistency is going to need to drive all of this. These were some of the, the successes that were in pockets throughout the district. But I think our goal moving forward is to have um, these be more consistent. But um, just around posting assignments with enough notice, um, helping families to organize their schedules, um, and consistency across that. Um, and also, I think there was appreciation for the fact that um, you know, as a district, we, we tried really hard to be supportive of our families in the, in the different places they might have been at um, during this crisis in the spring, and just really trying to keep um, an eye on the social emotional needs of our families as well. So, and, and just hearing from, from faculty and parents, um, we got a lot of exceptional feedback, and there were kind of a lot of common themes. In terms of health and safety concerns from faculty and staff, we've heard a lot of uh, concerns and questions about air quality and how that might affect the transmission of the virus, as well as kind of preventative maintenance schedules and how well our HVAC systems are operating. We've heard uh, quite a bit about kind of uh, the need for us to be a little bit more clear on guidelines for faculty and staff around what happens um, if a faculty has a pre-existing condition and they're unable to come to school. And so we've heard those, those questions both from faculty and parents as well, because we do know that with the current pandemic, um, some parents and some students um, may have a pre-existing medical condition that may preclude them from participating in school if we're able to come back in person. We do know that we're gonna to need to um, and plan to provide uh, PPEs for all staff and students will be required from pre-K through 12 or pre-K through post to wear masks unless they are, have a medical excuse or they're unable to do so for an, a, an, a reason that we need to kind of discuss, right? And so, and the reason for that, I know the guidance says that students in K and one would not be required to wear masks. We just feel like um, to be as safe as we can, that it's, it's more than reasonable to just expect that we just gonna set the standard that all of our students um, and our faculty wear masks when they're in the buildings. And so we're, we're thinking a lot about one-on-one um, -on -one service for special education students and one-on-one -on -one therapies. We're thinking about um, traveling staff and students um, and so those are, those are things that have come up in regard to common themes and questions that have been on the side of both faculty and parents. Parents have shared a lot of concern, and Kara touched on this, about just continuity of service. Several of our parents have reached out to us and they've provided feedback both within the survey format and outside of the survey format to say, you know, we have two children. We have a third grader and, you know, a, a second grader. And our third grade son is their teacher has created a schedule that's predictable, routines that are easy to follow. And our second grader, the schedule is, is less structured. And moving forward, we, we know that if we're going to improve our remote model, either as a standalone or as a part of a hybrid model, we know that we need to significantly improve our remote learning model, right? We know we need to create uh, more predictable schedules and routines for kids. We know that we need to create more opportunities for students to interact with more than one teacher. Um, and we also know that we need to be able to have conversations that we provide feedback to students that lead to us giving grades. And so I, I know that this is being discussed across the state in terms of how, we, how do you do that if you're in a remote model. Some districts are creating at the secondary level they're creating assessment calendars where if you're in a class, you might have two assessments a quarter 
it's on the schedule, um, and, and kind of students can look for it. And so one of the things that we need to be very clear about is that the remote part of our instruction, we need to be able to grade and kind of really Im improve the quality of that as we're moving forward, and student engagement is part of that as well. A, a big part of this, and, and people have asked a lot about synchronous and asynchronous learning. And so synchronous learning is a pre-existing schedule where you can go online and you can learn with a group of students all at the same time. Asynchronous would mean that you can, if something is recorded or you can stream it when you are available, um, it, and you can kind of use that that's convenient to your schedule. Um, for some students, um, both models can work. For other students, one works better than the other. So we're investigating ways to support uh, faculty to really, um, to get them the tools and the hardware as well as the software to really investigate e both of those models. So there'll be more to follow on that. Um, so there's gonna be some training to start the school year. I'll talk a little bit about that. And, and so we're also thinking about varying approaches to if we're gonna be serving students in a hybrid for part of the week um, for in-person instruction or for remote instruction, we need to think about the sizes of the groups that we're working with. I think you had touched on yeah. this. First, yeah. And so, um, so when we think about kind of the spring remote that we just had, right? We had 61 days of remote learning. Um, and you know, we, we, we provided what we thought we could, right? And so um, we didn't grade, things were pass fail. And so, and again, there needed to be more continuity. And we can see that in the, in the pie charts that are presented. And so, um, and I talked a little bit about areas of improvement on the right side that we're thinking about for the fall. So we, we have built in breaks um, for, the, for the committee to ask questions. So I don't know if you have questions at this point. Go ahead, Mike. Sorry. Uh, so, Doug, one question I had, you just speak about whether it's asynchronous where you might record something and someone could go back and look at it later, whether you would, you know, in the class at the time and you wanted to refer back to it later mm -hmm. and things of that sort. Um, are there any intentions within the context of, okay, you got a certain amount of kids in a classroom? There may be half of that class that is is remote, or there there may be just a few kids that are remote. Will there be any sort of live streaming so that that remote child who would normally be in that classroom with those other kids can also be seeing it uh, through their computer at the same time, or will it only be a recording type process? Will they not have access to live streaming of the actual lecture as it's taking place? Yeah. So live <laughs> live streaming, Mike, falls into yes. the category of of synchronous learning, right? And so if, for example, you know, Algebra 1 is being taught first period at the high school, um, students, you know, this is, you, you see, we see this now frequently at colleges, right? And so um, we have some faculty um, that have the expertise and experience to do this um, and have kind of the hardware and technology to do it. This is something that we have to kind of grow into and, and to kind of create or to create the expectation that we're, we will all be in that space, um, I, don't, I don't think that we're quite there yet in terms of our professional development and also the development of the technolog technological infrastructure. So, um, but I think it's something that you're gonna see more and more of, Mike. But I think, yeah, I I think it's a great tool. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to jump in just in terms of, it, it sounds also like you're referencing the concept of families choosing full remote learning if the district proceeds with a hybrid. And so that's something, you know, that we, we did dig into a little in our, um, our reopening plan as something that will um, require some more planning and preparation for um, if, we, if we proceed with a hybrid model. Um, it will be a situation where we're going to have to first get a sense of who is who, um, who, who are the families that are choosing full remote learning, even if we go forward with a hybrid. Um, we have had some families also speak out about wanting to homeschool, which would give families a little bit more flex, um, you know, to, to create their own schedules for learning for their students. 
So that's something I think once we um, make a final decision about which direction we're going forward with as a district, we'll be looking to figure out who those families are and then um, cohort them accordingly and staff accordingly so that um, they have access to as much live remote instruction as possible. Um, the, the live streaming into classes that are already going on, um, I think that that could be challenging in a couple of different ways, but it's something we, we still need to explore further. Yeah, I would agree. At least they should have access to the recordings. Obviously, ideally sure. live stream, so they're getting at the same time, but at least recordings. Otherwise, I just worry that even if we go with a hybrid model, the remote kids are gonna think they're second class citizens in some way as far Absolutely. as them. So where yeah. we can bridge that gap would be better. And one of the things that we've been talking about on our um, calls with the Commissioner of Education, too, is the D Department of S Elementary and Secondary Education, um, DESE, is, is researching right now learning management systems that districts can opt into at an affordable cost, which would um, have, um, you know, would be standards-based curriculum built, built into it. Um, so that's something that they're looking to make available to districts as well. So just in terms of something to work off of for those families. Thanks, Kara. Yeah. Mike, but you also bring up a great point, which is, um, it would be great if a student was able to do X, right? So it's interesting in the, in the communication that we get and in our survey data that we look at and when we talk to parents and interact with them, you know, some say, you know, I, if my child had a synchronous model and a, and a structured schedule, they could have thrived this past spring. It would have been great for them. And we have other parents that say, there's no way that my son or daughter could follow a schedule and they need <laughs> you know, another accommodation where they need to do it on kind of their own time. And so no, it, we're, this is again this, and I make note of this because no matter what plan we create, it's going to create a challenge for someone, right? Yeah, and, and so, I sort of think if we start out hybrid and God forbid we have to go back to fully remote, it would make up for a better experience right out of the gate right. uh, if we had this set up. But I understand there are some limitations and short-term challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I th yeah, we're going to be able to talk more about this, Mike. Great. And so at this point in the slideshow, we're going to move into um, describing plans that we created and the feasibility work that we did in determining what Wakefield could do and to talk a little bit about our kind of reasoning behind each plan. So we were asked by the, the Commissioner of Education to literally to, to empty classrooms and to try to set up classrooms um, with, with students socially distant um, between three and six feet apart. The World Health Organization says three feet. The, our CDC says six feet. And so, you know, there's a kind of this back and forth. You know, I, I think what we are in agreement on is that the farther the better. Right. And so uh, but we looked at three feet. We looked, we, you know, we emptied de emptied classrooms. Um, we measured three desks three feet apart. Um, and then we kind of emptied those desks out of the classroom and got a tape measure and put um, desks in six feet apart. Right. And so just to see what that would look like and feel like and really giving some serious thought to if can we get everyone back into the buildings. Right. And so if that's a possibility for us, you know, what would it look like? What would it look like to uh, transform our field house into classrooms? What would it look like to transform um, educational spaces into almost any, any place we can make them, right? And so I, I think what we, you know, we did this. And, and I have to say our, our reopening teams and the administrative teams were amazing in this space. You know, we saw the high school administrators with uh, kind of that wheel that you put on the ground, like the surveyors use that measure distance. Um, and we saw others, you know, we saw Joe Mullaney with a tape measure around the high school. Some were more sophisticated and they used kind of the, um, a tool that was issued by um, the Massachusetts School Building Authority. And so, but at, at the end of all of this, when we walked schools and looked at classrooms and we saw, for example, kindergarten classrooms and first grade classrooms um, where that were empty, you know, and students, we, you know, there were desks um, or tables where students were six feet apart. Um, we, we realized very quickly that, you know, 
the idea or the goal of getting people in, the question was really at what cost? Mm -hmm. So what was clear is that it would have severely impacted the instructional model. In addition to, um, we just, where we ended up is that we just didn't think that we could do it safely. So, um, so one of our recommendations in looking at the creation of and feasibility of having everyone return for a full in-person model, we've, we've determined as, as groups um, and as teams and as a district leadership group that that's not feasible to do safely. And so the, the, other, the next kind of level for us was really trying to be attentive to the idea that um, students need Students need to get back to school, right? There are some students, um, we've heard from parents that have been in touch with us that very caringly um, have asked us, you know, my son is in a special education program and they need to be in school to receive service. We've heard from other parents and we've heard from administrative teams um, of conversations that they too have had um, with parents and, and students that have really shared kind of this, this concept that there's, there's such a loss um, socially um, as well as the academic components um, that you know, we really thought that the next possibility for us was a hybrid model, right? And so I, I wanna be clear to anyone watching tonight as well as to the committee what hybrid instructional model looks like or what that means. And so if full instruction is kind of life as we used to know it, right? Schedules were over here. We're, we're teaching full-time schedules in person. The day's predictable. You know, the schedules are what we had March 12th when we left school. Um, and then because of the pandemic and because we needed to quarantine, we went full remote. So if one end of the spectrum is full remote and the other end of the spectrum is full in person, hybrid is something in the middle where students would come to school for some portion of the week. The reason that we would create a hybrid model um, and the benefit is you essentially cut class sizes in half to make smaller groups so that students can be socially distant and can be kept apart and, and as safe as we can possibly keep them, right? And so, and within the hybrid kind of plan, the hybrid instructional model, 90% of the districts in the state are proposing some type of hybrid instructional model. And really there are three types that are being presented across the state. One type is in splitting students in half and creating a cohort A and a cohort B. One cohort would go to school one week, another cohort might go another week, right? So it'd be week on, week off. Some districts are presenting, like us, are presenting students being in school to be taught in person for a portion of the week. So they come for Monday, Tuesday, there'll be a break, and then they'll come for Thursday, a second group would come Thursday and Friday. And when the first group is not in school, they would learn remotely for those three days. And the same thing for the other group that might learn later in the week. And the third hybrid plan is the splitting of school days. And so, and what that is is you know, students coming for a morning session and students coming for an afternoon session. And we've created, in, in terms of our hybrid model, um, this, this concept to get as many students as we can in school safely, um, and w again, while keeping them at a safe distance. So we really feel strongly that the best way for us to go at the elementary level is to have students come in for a morning session and then to have another group of students to come in for an afternoon session. And so, um, I don't know if, if it's a good time. I mean, we could probably get into that with the schedules. Yeah. yeah. And so when we talk about schedules, yeah. we'll hear from the principals um, who are joining us on this call. And so one of the exceptional points or positives of the elementary hybrid schedule is that it takes the pressure off of families to do remote instruction because kids would be with a teacher Monday through Thursday. And Friday would be off where teachers could plan, we could clean the buildings, and then we would have students back in on Monday. 
And so the plan is for there'd be a cohort A in, in the morning, there would be a break during the day, and we would have cleaning teams go around and clean and sanitize. And then we would have another group in in the afternoon. So that's what we would be presenting at the elementary level. At the middle school and high school level, we would be creating a, a two one two plan, meaning students in for two days, um, and then learning remote for three days. You know, while our, our models at each level have common themes, um, they're really differentiated based on student needs, uh, staff structure, and our ability to team, and really make use of, of all of our faculty. You know, and one of the drivers here, in terms of this idea of hybrid or getting back to an in-person, you know, we really, again, feel strongly if, if, the, if the economy is reopening, um, that we really need to try try to get back and again be prepared if the public health data requires us to make a turn in the other direction we'll be able to do that so we're also um, talking about a phased reopening and so the commissioner of education has determined that the school year will not be 180 days this year but will be 170 days and the reason is is to allow for professional development for the first 10 days of the school year for teachers. Uh, we're proposing a phase two, um, which is kind of a modified return for students. And again, these dates, um, we, we may expand these dates and really think about what different groups of students might need at different levels. But again, this is our preliminary draft. And so then a phase three would be to actually start um, a hybrid instruction model for all students. Great. So I think if you want to just click ahead, I think you just touched on that one. Go get them. So yeah, the phase reopening, um, Doug just hit on all of those points. Again, you know, not to reiterate, but it's, it's really a concept of, of getting the students back. I'll just give everyone a minute to look at that slide. Uh, sorry, getting the teachers and staff back first and having them reacclimate to their buildings, um, reconnect with their colleagues, um, get up to speed on new safety protocols and procedures, and um, set up their new learning spaces um, with the hybrid model and the safety guidelines. I think our, our classrooms are going to look very different um, for the school year, so just giving teachers a sense of, of how they can best set those um, classrooms up for, for best in instruction while maintaining safety guidelines. And then, um, you know, the phase two right there, um, Doug hit on all these other phases just to, to slowly acclimate students back into the buildings. Um, I think one of the things that we heard um, from a lot of our, our teachers was just that worry about starting the school year without having the proper time to, to build the relationships that really become the foundation of their work with students throughout the school year. I think the spring, um, you know, the, we had a lot of challenges in the spring, but I think one of the things that really helped us to get through is the time of year that it fell. And I think our teachers had um, a nice foundation built with their, with their students in terms of relationship building. Um, because I think we all know, you know, kids don't really work that hard for teachers that they don't feel connected to or don't feel um, like they, they, want, they can work for. So I think that piece is really important. So how we build those relationships is going to look really different. And then uh, Doug talked again about the, the start of the hybrid, which dates are subject to change. So, um, so I'm going to move in. If we can just uh, go ahead to the next sure. slide. So as we go into the next couple of slides, this starts our more detailed overview of the schedules at each of the buildings. Um, I'd like to first just start by saying um, that I'm, I'm really proud of our, our building principals and the reopening teams. I know, you know, Doug, is, I speak for both of us. They've, they worked really hard um, under really challenging circumstances. I think we were all, um, we had a bit of a grieving period in the beginning of this process, just really thinking about what, what we're losing going into the school year in terms of what we know to be best instructional practices, um, you know, best schedules, um, you know, w what we all relied on for so many years, and we knew we had to let some things go. Um, but building these schedules, I'm really proud of how our teachers, our staff, our administrators really thought about how to best maximize the in-person time with our students. And developmentally, that looks so different at every level. Um, we talked a lot about what students need and who they are as learners and how dependent they are at the pre-K and elementary levels and uh, reliant on their teachers and their, and their parents to support them. 
And that just absolutely had to look different than um, our upper middle, um, our high school students as well. Um, so, so I just I want that to be thought out that that was the mindset going into this process was safety first, and then maximizing instruction for our students and what um, setting up the best possible learning environments when we had them in front of us. Um, so I'm going to start with the Doyle schedule. Um, if we can just get that, it's there. Okay. So the Doyle, Doyle is our integrated preschool, and when planning the schedule for the Doyle, we had to think about this a little bit different. Um, with our preschool model, it's not, um, there aren't the entitlements to service as there are in K-12. to our, our public preschool, um, the foundation, is to serve our students who are referred to us from early intervention and who have IEPs and require special education services to help transition them into our school system. It's really, um, it's the, the remaining pieces of Doyle are all heavily focused on um, our peer model population, students who t we tuition in to um, support and balance our classrooms and um, be peer models for our students with disabilities. So that really played into this in terms of um, the Doyle meeting the needs of our students with special needs, but also having really that service component to the community um, of, of parents who are paying tuition to g gain a service for their students. And I, I think in speaking with um, teachers, uh, or administrators, our preschool parents, um, hearing, uh, seeing the survey data, I think remote learning for preschool really um, kind of defeats the purpose in a lot of ways. I think, uh, you know, our preschool students are our youngest learners. Um, they learn hands-on, they learn with their teachers, they learn by examples, and um, remote really just wasn't cutting it. So what we needed to create was a schedule that met the needs of our youngest learners, brought in sustainable tuition to keep that program functioning, and also um, gave parents something um, that they felt was worth it for their children. Um, to invest in and to, and to leave the home for. So um, I think the Doyle reopening team did a great job coming up with the schedule. It's really, it's, it's a mostly full-time schedule. Um, and again, the, the, class, uh, the class numbers are ranging from nine to 12, and they're based on the families. Um, the numbers are based, we're, we're anticipating that we can fill them based on families who already indicated that they were um, all in for a full day program and um, paying full day tuition. And so we, we run Monday through Thursday, full days. Um, it's, it will be a grab and go or bring your own lunch. And then Friday is an earlier release at 11.15, um, which allows time for um, you know, extra teacher prep and planning and cleaning. Um, so I think, you know, I think we'll have high interest in this program. We've also been monitoring you know, the private preschools within the community as well, um, just to see what they're able to serve. So our goal was really to meet the needs of our students in special education and those that we anticipate being referred to us through early intervention throughout the school year, but also um, providing the service to our families for as many kids as we could. So I can um, pass that over. We have Matt Carter and Tiffany back here from the elementary level to speak to the elementary schedule. All right, thanks, Kara. Um, so for the elementary level, we started by thinking about what would make the most sense for kids. Uh, Doug spoke a little earlier about some of the different models that were looked at in different districts for hybrid. And one of the things that we know about our elementary students is that we wanted to minimize the gaps between times that students were in school in front of teachers. We wanted to, we didn't want them to have long stretches of time where they were doing remote learning at home. We heard from families, we heard from staff, that that was really challenging especially for the younger students, but even up through fourth grade, remote learning with just full days of it was very difficult. So the model that we put together is with the cohort A and cohort B that splits the school day. And with this model, it allows all students to have time in front of their teacher in school each day of the week, Monday through Thursday, with Friday morning being remote in the morning and then afternoon time for um, cleaning and prep and planning for the teachers. The other thing that helps with that schedule is that even though, you know, cohort A would go to school in the morning and then they would be doing remote learning in the afternoon, but this would be a very different kind of remote learning than they would be doing if they were doing a full day of remote learning. They would have had time with their teacher in the morning. They would have had instruction. They have, might have things that they're 
finishing at home. They might have tasks that they're doing, such as you know computer-based tasks like iReady or ST Math or some of the different programs that students had already started using in the spring. It would help um, with that dependence factor that our elementary school students have. They wouldn't be having to watch a teacher teaching online and then initiate a task by themselves based on what they're seeing online. They would actually be able to hear from their teacher, go home, work on it, and then come back the next day to get feedback again from their teacher. And we think that's really important for the students at the elementary level. Yeah, and I can't echo enough, like for us, the priority really needs to be how do we get students in front of our teachers um, as much as possible. I think we heard loud and clear from families and from our staff as well that, you know, in the spring, there were some challenges, especially in the lower elementary grades with the remote um, learning and our guiding piece here along with safety was how do we put students in front of our, our staff and, and really start kind of laying the foundational groundwork um, for them to be successful um, as they progress through school. Um, I will say that we are hearing very similar concerns um, from staff. Um, I do want to thank my re-entry team. I think they've um, been super helpful in kind of guiding um, my thought process and the work that I brought back to the team. Um, but also even this afternoon hearing some feedback from parents too. Um, I will say that we don't think any hybrid model is, is perfect, um, but we are trying to you know, kind of use the lens of how do we put students kind of first and how do we kind of prioritize their learning with any, within any sort of hybrid model. And uh, if, if I can just add, jump in, Matt and Tiffany, I know one of the things that uh, the elementary group, um, you know, just to add some context, the, element, the four elementary schools worked really closely, um, the principals uh, worked really closely and um, had consistency across messaging with reopening groups. But I think one of the things that was picked up um, in our reopening doc was that, that difference in, and I, and I would, I would say that you know we we didn't catch that um, slight fixing that slight change in the reopening doc, but we started out trying to have cohorts of three hours each for kids. Um, we felt like the three hours uh, in the morning, like an eight fifteen to eleven fifteen, um, and then an, an afternoon cohort for three hours would be ideal instructionally. But the topic of um, adequate time for cleaning has come up um, a couple of times, and just wanting to ensure that. Um, you know, that we, we can uh, follow through on that piece. And I know Bob Shirley is going to speak to time studies that he's doing with his custodial staff. Um, but one of the, the last minute changes in the schedule that was put out was uh, reducing that uh, the cohort times to two and a half hours from three to add an extra hour and a half to add an hour and a half for cleaning in the middle. Um, so I think, you know, again, we put out times as a, um, as a concept, but as we refine and we get feedback and we learn more, um, they're subject to change. Um, I think a three-hour block, I think all of you do too, um, think that a three-hour block would be ideal, but putting safety first, we have to make sure that we have adequate time for cleaning. So I just wanted to hit on that point. Anything else? Okay. All right, so now, um, thank you, Tiffany and Matt. We can move over. Um, we have Adam Colantoni here from Galvin who can speak to the grade five and six hybrid schedule as well as the grade seven and eight hybrid schedule. Thank you, Kara. Uh, I just want to thank the Galvin Rancher team for all their hard work on this task. And I certainly want to thank our family for your patience as we work on this process. Um, you know, tonight we know it's a lot of information to digest in all these plans. And every model that we thought through, we knew would present challenges for our families, and we're committed to continue to work on that. Uh, at the middle school level, our team looked at a wide range of models, including uh, what an early release could look like. Uh, I'm working with the middle school principal group that meets weekly, and we're comparing notes across districts to try to see how similar we can be. The schedule we're presenting tonight, five to eight, uh, really focuses on the safest conditions possible, as we are at the elementary and high school. And at the middle school level, we're really focused on how to keep students engaged uh, throughout the week, whether they're at home or in school. Uh, that, that was a lot of feedback we received in the spring. I uh, was at the asynchronous learning at the middle school level. Um, proved to be difficult for students to manage their own time, their own learning. So we're really looking forward to a schedule that can give students some clear, consistent structures, both in school and at home. Um, and, and so that's one of the reasons why we split the week up uh, in thinking of a cohort model uh, for the hybrid. Uh, what you read tonight is fifth and sixth grade in school on Monday, Tuesday, um, and then at home on Thursday, Friday, and vice versa for seventh and eighth grade. 
Um, so we're really looking for as much face time as possible between students and teachers, whether that's in school or remotely. One of the advantages in this plan uh, at this time that we fail is that um, by cohorting the way we are, our students, when they're remote, um, their teachers won't have a cohort in school to have to balance the needs of. Um, they'll be able to meet with students while they're at home um, you know, through remote learning and then meet with that same group of students while they're in school. So we feel like it will provide a lot of continuity for our students throughout the week um, and really focus on synchronous learning, whether they're in the building or at home. So that's what really led to the way we split uh, the week rather than doing a five to eight cohort Monday, Tuesday, and a five to eight cohort on Thursday, Friday. We, we're looking at the week as grade levels um, a little bit differently. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of fine details in our plan that I'm, I'm happy to answer um, from our group here tonight. Uh, and certainly we're gonna be meeting with our Galvin community later in the week. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure how uh, deep you wanna get into details tonight with this group and what questions you might have, but that's really an overview of our schedule is that we're focused on synchronous learning Monday through Friday, whether it's home or at school. Okay. All right, and I think we're saving all questions yeah. at, to, until the end. Okay, thank you, Adam. And then, um, you know, we can move over to Amy McLeod is here from the high school, our high school principal, to speak about the high school schedule. Thanks, Kara. Um, so uh, thank you for having us here tonight to talk about this uh, and about our schedules. I want to just also thank the folks from the high school who helped to work on this plan. Um, we had administrators, teachers, counselors, uh, directors, and um, you know what you're what you're seeing in front of you is really an iteration of, um, and there have been many iterations <laughs> of, of of these plans, right? Um, and we are, as all the other teams have done, working um, using uh, survey data, um, state guidance, and feedback. Um, weekly meetings with principals from across the Middlesex League uh, and across the state, um, and, and really trying to take that um, changing guidance from the State Department of Education and work it into the plan um, continuously. Um, so like the other schools, I think our um, plan focuses on meeting the needs uh, developmentally of where high school students are. Um, if you look at our schedule, it is a, a basic uh, one, uh, a two, one, two. Um, hybrid schedule where we have uh, two cohorts, cohort A and B. Um, we are uh, planning to split the cohorts uh, somewhat alphabetically, um, really using alphabet as the basis of it um, so that we can group family siblings together, um, but then also taking into consideration some of our um, special populations. So um, potentially keeping our students who come from Boston together uh, in a cohort or um, thinking about where um, some of our students who need services such as uh, EL services or special education services um, and how to fit them and balance them into cohorts A and B so that um, our services can be spread out um, to meet the needs of students. Um, in that 212, if you're looking at the schedule, uh, essentially we are talking about two days of in-person um, and um, over those two days of in-person instruction, uh, students would go through six blocks of instruction. We thought this was really important to um, create longer blocks. Um, and we did that kind of strategically, knowing that students would need um, some uh, deeper learning, given that we'd be coming back from full remote learning in the spring, we really feel like teachers need some time to dig in uh, during those blocks. And if we're gonna be seeing students less time during the week, we wanted deeper learning time when students and teachers um, are together. Um, our Wednesday uh, would be a full day of um, synchronous remote learning. And one of the things that we heard from both parents and teachers and students was it was sometimes hard to meet on a schedule regularly, similar to what um, Adam said at the middle school. So um, Wednesday is set up that students from both cohorts A and B would meet together with their teachers. Um, and so that would um, help students to create a sense of community um, um, with everybody who is in that uh, in both cohorts um, and really get a sense of a real classroom experience even though it would be uh, done remotely um, and then the two days that a student is not in uh, person they would be doing um, live, um, sorry asynchronous learning and so with the high school that could be a number of different things doug mentioned some of them um, pre-recorded lessons or discussion boards um, or demos um, or even collaborative discussion forums. And I think that's um, so many of our teachers at the high school level have really grown their um, skills uh, in using technology to uh, provide better asynchronous learning. 
Um, also at the high school level, we feel that students are able to do uh, two days of asynchronous learning um, on their own, where they'd have the three other days, two being in person and then one being synchronous. Um, the six period schedule is a change from what we currently do, um, but we feel like we need to do that based on the rotation of the schedule. Um, we also don't want to have ASCs in our schedule anymore based on the fact that we want the time in school to be spent in academic um, learning blocks. Um, and so um, we would be working on student schedules over the next few weeks. Um, and so to get rid of, to uh, eliminate the ASCs, we would be uh, offering health and wellness remotely. And so um, regardless of, of the hybrid plan, uh, Brendan Kent and his team is working on creating uh, health and wellness modules for the high school. So students would be working on those um, uh, in a, an asynchronous model uh, remotely. Um, I think just to point out a few benefits of, of, of this hybrid schedule, um, I think when we talk about meeting the needs of students and teachers uh, in an in-person model, I think the hybrid kind of hits the sweet spot. Um, we're able to, again, uh, get more face time um, with students so that students can make connections, um, have those baseline lessons as a small cohort, uh, then have the synchronous Wednesdays together. Um, you'll notice the early dismissal um, in our schedule, um, and I think that that had to be done for a number of reasons. Um, we weren't able to figure out how to provide lunches safely uh, in a building of our size and structure at the high school. Um, but the afternoon 90 minute block is a learning time. And so um, we're thinking about ways that the students who are not in person on those two days could get, can get supports um, remotely in the afternoon. There may be students who stay through who are in person to get academic supports, to get guidance supports, um, essentially maybe to get some of the services that we need to provide that can't fit into the six block day. Um, you know, and then um, the idea of having older students who are able to be home a little bit earlier than the younger children, I know that can help with uh, families. I know in my family, that's an important thing for my older to help with the youngers. Um, and so we think in this cu current context, having students there and available, um, it also helps with the bus schedule for the district in terms of meshing our schedule with the other two um, levels or three levels in the district. Um, finally, I think the one thing that we heard that was loud and clear to us, um, not only um, Adam talked about the uh, discussion about synchronous and asynchronous learning and what we heard about that, we also heard the high school students needing enough time to be able to do the work assigned. Um, when you get to the high school level, we're talking about a gradual release. Students need time to work um, on their, uh, on their uh, assignments and activities uh, independently. And I think it's important that we build that into our schedule so that students aren't feeling like they go home at two o'clock and then now they're on their screens from two o'clock till, till eight o'clock or whatever, trying to catch up with the work because it's a hybrid model. Um, the idea of having those two asynchronous days uh, at home um, allows them to work on extended assignments, um, do a little bit more of independent work, but then still have the opportunity as uh, the other principals have said, to check in with their teachers and have that ability to connect. Um, so. That's sort of the highlight of the high school um, and where we are with our plan um, thus far. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. So I think at this point we can open it up to questions. Questions. So, so if we, do you want me to structure it for the group and we can go through? And, um, going back to Doyle, um, any questions related to the Doyle? We can Mike. maybe go through Mike. by level. Sure, Mike. Mike, was it? Did you have a question, Mike? Uh, nothing on Doyle. Okay, so. so no one has any questions on Doyle? Can I just um, okay. clarify yeah. the Doyle? The Excellent. class sizes are going to be between 9 and 12? So we, we um, the reopening team had done measurements around all the spaces in Doyle, and based on the, the number of kids in a class is really based on um, the size of that classroom. So okay. they ranged from, uh, we'll have nine classrooms, and they range from 9 to 12, most being 11 was the average okay. class size. Okay. That's all I had for Doyle. Okay. All right. Ellen, any questions uh, for the oh, Chris? Chris? Okay. I was just wondering, you know, the, the Doyle schedule is so different than the elementary schedule. Could you explain to me why they're not the same? Sure, I can, I can explain that. 
Um, yeah, so so the Doyle, you know, again, just going back to why we have, you know, the, the, the main purpose of our integrated preschool and why we offer that, you know, we're, you know, as a school district, we have to offer K through 12. Our pre-K is to meet the needs of our students with disabilities in the district who are referred to us from early intervention. And then the integrated preschool model is built around that as its core. And um, the fact that Doyle, um, students who attend Doyle who aren't on IEPs pay tuition really drives that model. So um, unless we bring in a sustainable amount of tuition, then our staffing numbers, everything is really, um, you know, works off of that. Um, so we, we, we worked hard to try to create a model that not only met our special education needs within the building, but also brought in enough uh, tuition to maintain our current levels of staffing in appropriate right. class size. You're also required at that um, in that program to have a, a certain balance of typical and special needs kids are you right. not and right and you have the room to maintain that ratio never mind about the tuitions you know the ratio has to be maintained and you have the space to do that yeah so so we did we had um, we're I think our, our number is around 125 total students that we will be able to take in we had 33 students who are currently on IEPs for um, you know certain goals, not all of those IEPs require um, a full day program. Um, but I think a lot of our, our students on IEPs, the parents, if they weren't offered it through the IEP, wanted to um, pay the difference and participate in a full day um, just for the exposure. Um, so we did have um, you know with the model that we're able to put forth, we were able to accommodate um, most of the most, if not all, of the families who had. Um, in our survey information before the closure indicated that they wanted a full day program. So the, the ratios are still balanced. We're, you know, we should be working off like a 40-60 split in a preschool classroom in terms, in terms of students with disabilities to peer models. And um, we're definitely um, able to maintain that with, with even more peer models than, than the averages that we should have in, in the classrooms. Does that help? Is that good? Okay. I think Colleen had a question. Mike, Mike as well. Colleen, um, go ahead. Go ahead, Colleen. On the elementary level, I'm sorry. I, I was. Okay. <laughs> so, Mike, did you have a question for Doyle? Oh, no, not on Doyle. No, okay. I'm sorry. I thought we were okay. good gone. Oh, yeah. I think we're good with Doyle. We're going to go with Doyle. <laughs> so, moving on to elementary. Um, yeah, Colleen, you had a question. Yeah, so uh, for Matt or Tiffany, um, so in in the model, the AMPM model, just to clarify for our our parents, um, because each teacher is engaged with the alternate cohort of students during um, the in between the classroom, the remote learning will look more like student directed learning. So, does that mean it looks more like homework enrichment and extension of what they learned in person? Um, I'm thinking particularly when you're in the AM co cohort and you haven't been in school, maybe you are taking your PM work that you did the day before and applying that to the morning and you have that time and space, but you don't necessarily have access to your teacher because that teacher is teaching the other cohort. So it's, it's sort of a homework time, enrichment time, reading time. Is that how you're looking at it? That's pretty accurate. And, you know, we have had that conversation about, you know, is there a way that how can we support find ways to support those children who are at home during the morning or during the afternoon are there other ways we can set up some office hours or can we have some other activities because the classroom teacher is going to be teaching the other half of the students but we know full well that students that are at home working you know regardless of how well they're set up or how much how familiar they are with the activities there are going to be those times where they have questions or need some support so that's a part of the plan we're still looking at Okay, great. And we also have the staff that we feel can really support um, students, you know, whether they're at home or in the classroom as well. So we are kind of looking at this as being an opportunity um, to for students to do their homework or to do a little more on the enrichment side. Um, and we can use staff, I think, strategically to make that happen at home as well. Staff meaning more than just their classroom teachers, their aides, you know, 
So at Woodville in particular, like we have, you know, a, a large, you know, a large number of ISPs, which are our instructional support personnel, and, and we can kind of use those staff members to support students if they were in need of that. At home. Thinking about also reading specialists, interventionists, I mean, other staff members who would normally be pushing into multiple classrooms. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike, did you have a question in regards to elementary? Actually, I have a few questions for okay. Tiffany and Matt. Um, I guarantee you, as you're going to your parent roadshow this week, the schedule <laughs> is going to dominate. 75 or 80 percent of the questions you're going to get. So it's important we we have a decent discussion on this. So my questions are, are several. Uh, one is, um, you have Friday as a as an exclusively remote day. Both the high school and the middle school have Wednesday as an exclusively remote day. Why do we try to sync it up so they all have the same totally remote day? I'm thinking of the parents. I understand we want to build the best educational structure for our kids, and that's what we're here to do. But the fact that the parents' availability and their work commitments and you know a half day doesn't really help them. A full day allows them to perhaps work a full day, half day, you know, you might as well just have no day from the perspective of their ability to work. So I just want to make sure we understand and we're com comfortable with the fact that, um, you know, you may have multiple parents, kids may, have, uh, parents may have multiple kids, one in the high school, one in the middle school, and one in Dole Bear. Wouldn't it be nice if they all had the same day where they were at home? Yeah. So is the there any magic behind Friday or could it be Wednesday to sync up with the other two? So when we when we developed this schedule, no. we originally developed it with Friday as as the day, thinking that that's four days in a row that the kids are in school, making connections with their teacher, being in there. Mm. We have had the conversation of could we switch it to Wednesday? Yes, that's something we can absolutely do. We're still kind of working out the details of that, but we don't see that as it has to be on Friday. You know, we want to think about our families. We want to think about what's going to be best for everybody. So that's something we could definitely look at doing. I think, what, I think what drove most of that conversation, Mike, was just around um, so much of our work at elementary is around routine and procedure that if we could do four days in a row, um, that would help on the kind of teaching and learning side. But absolutely, like Tiffany said, we're open to that feedback and we expect I'm it. Sure, I'm sure everybody's uh, routines are out the window at this stage anyway, so we're all starting anew, so probably won't be as big an adjustment there. And then the second question is, so you have a class that the first half of that cohort, cohort A goes in the morning, cohort B goes in the afternoon. The advantage, can you go through a little bit the advantages of each of them having a half day versus let's say you have cohort A that goes the entire day Monday, cohort B goes the entire day Tuesday, cohort A goes the entire day Thursday, and cohort B goes the entire day on Friday. Once again, this is more of a parent and trying to plan their schedules as well. If, if it doesn't make sense, I get it. I just wanted to throw that out there. I mean, I think I think that goes back to the idea of trying to trying to change what the remote learning aspect of it looks like and avoiding having a full day where students are expected to do remote learning versus time in school and then having some work that they're doing more independently. Okay. Okay. And Matt, you can add to that if there's more. I think that's that's sums it up pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Well, those are my questions. Oh, actually, sorry. Um, the infamous cleaning the bath, the classrooms in between the uh, the morning session and the afternoon session. How is that going to happen? I mean, who's going to do it, and how is it going to be done in an hour and a half? If it's teachers, they have to eat. You know, probably have a few things to do. How, how do you envision that happening? So we've we've actually um, been engaged in conversation with uh, Bob Shiroli, our facilities director, around that work. And part of the reason why we've expanded that middle section is based on the feedback we received from him. So this might be a question that he could help us with. Whenever you're ready, Bob. <laughs> yeah, just just trying to unmute myself. Uh, so, so as. Uh, as you pose the question, right, how do we do it in, in that time with um, limited resources and the, and the amount of desks and, and chairs we have in each classroom? Um, you know, this is really something that, you know, we're all in this uh, together. And I think, you know, our cleaning plans, um, you know, rely on everyone to do their part. Um, the, the plan is for each school, the elementary level, is I'm going to bring a second custodian in during this hour and a half to assist the day custodian to help with the cleaning but again that's it high touch surfaces bathrooms 
and, and that's throughout the school, but you know, the desks and the chairs in the classrooms, that's, and that's based on relying with uh, everyone to, to help out during this time. Yeah, I assume it's just a kindergarten teach classrooms that have bathrooms in them. Is that correct, Bob? Correct. Yep, yep. So the custodians, custodians in this plan would, would go in and hit those in the high touch surface areas um, throughout those classrooms. Yep. Excellent. Thank you very much. Anybody else have any questions? Um, Susie. As a follow up to that question, um, Bob, would custodians from typically assigned to other schools help out at the elementary schools in order to make that happen? Is it kind That's, of all so, hands on deck at wherever needed? Pretty much. So first, first, uh, you know, with the union, the overtime would be offered to the second shift custodians. But if they're unavailable or if we need help, then yes, other schools would uh, would definitely be pulled in to assist. Okay. Um, and then my other question was around um, the remote day, whether it be Friday or if we moved it to Wednesday. Um, Doug, at the beginning of the meeting, you said something about that day being off. And then in here, it, it says kind of remote. And I, I've gotten some feedback from elementary parents saying, what, what is that day? What is that mm -hmm. day going to look like? Um, I believe, Tiffany, you said <clears throat> that it would be um, remote learning in the morning and, that, and then the afternoon would be for teacher planning. But I'm thinking for students specifically, because parents are thinking what's happening on that remote day. What does that look right. like? Is that potentially specialists? I know in your schedule you've got either two or three specialist blocks um, that are, are noted. You know, Could it be specialists? Could it be um, teacher run, uh, you know, the, the assigned teacher running remote um, uh, activities? So if you could just talk a, a little bit more about that, because I, I think that there's some con potentially confusion around what that looks like. Yeah. And I think I think all of those things you were just saying could be part of what that Friday looks like, um, you know, specialist enrichment activities, some synchronous learning, remote learning with the classroom teacher, you know, morning meeting kinds of things. There are a lot of different options for that. And, you know, I know Kara has you know said and Doug has said, no, you know, we're, the plans are still evolving. We're still working on it. So if we have some other ways that we can make that a more valuable learning experience for our students that's really the goal i mean our goal is to create these important learning experiences for students so if we can find another way and have some other ideas that people are suggesting to do that we want to do that thank you I have one other question um and it had to do with the uh, um wednesdays um so let's assume it's wednesday for argument's sake will the teachers be allowed to conduct their remote classes at their respective schools so versus I, having to do them at home so i you know we, we've gone back and forth on what that remote teaching aspect would look like and where it would take place um i i'm i'm a fan of having kind of you know teachers in classrooms and using resources having access to colleagues um, having access to our technology but you know it, it really kind of within a hybrid model i think more discussion um could happen and my second question is really so you can tell I'm touting Wednesday, is you could always use Wednesday as a deep clean day too. So two days on a deep clean, two days on another deep clean on Saturday or Sunday. So there are some other potential benefits as well to Wednesday. Okay, I'll stop talking about Wednesday. <laughs> no, we are we duly noted on Wednesday. <laughs> so can I can I also address um, the questions about cleaning that, that Mike brought up? There's a, a lot of anxiety about us having sufficient staff and being able to clean schools in between groups of students coming into the building. Um, and and I, I will share with you what we have shared with the WA leaders. If we can't effectively clean, we won't do that model, right? And so, you know, but, but we do believe that we can. And, and Bob Shiroli, it's good having an MBA as a facilities director. Like he's made this a little bit of a science experiment and he's committed to figuring this out. We're also hiring um, some new custodians to come in and support this as well, right? And so initially what we had started with in elementary is we were looking at uh, the 212 model, which would be, which was similar to our middle school and high school. But, uh, but again, in, in just 
hearing from our reopening teams and really hearing from our principals. Um, you know, I, I think I f certainly felt mm -hmm. like the model that they are presenting um, really gave students the best opportunity um, to see te their teachers every day, right? As opposed to there being gaps in time. You know, in a two-on-two -two model or a, a two days in, two full days with three days remote, um, you know, that gives, that gives students, you know, three days of remote learning. Some of our students, you know, in K-1, um, well, we just felt like that was, the, the kids needed more. Correct me if I'm off, Matt or Tiffany, that I just want to reflect our conversations accurately. Yep, they're accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but again, I, I just want to be clear in my communication. You know, um, if we can't execute a part of the plan, we're not going to do that plan. But, but that doesn't mean that we're still not, that doesn't mean that we're not committed to the hybrid concept. I want to be crystal clear about that, right? Because we really feel strongly that we need to get kids into school in person um, to do our best work. So. Amy, I had one more question about sure. elementary. Um, I think, Tiffany, that you said that you are going to, that you're probably going to split cohorts across um, using the alphabet so that families with more than one child in elementary school would definitely be on the same plan. Is, did I hear that correctly? So I think high school was talking about alphabetical. I mean, obviously we would want to build our cohorts so that students that are in the same family would be in the same cohort. Okay. Um, just another, another twist to that is just we need to look at our classrooms and make sure that we're building our balanced classrooms and you know, doing A through L isn't going to create, you know, at Greenwood, one classroom that has much, many more students than the other classroom. So we would just kind of have to see what the effect of that is. I think, I think what we would do, Susie, is we would take that on a case by case. <coughs> case by case. And look, yeah. yeah. Okay. And look at it instead, instead, instead of saying generally alpha, because I think we would end up exactly in the space that Tiffany described. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be high alpha. school is I guess, different than elementary. Right, yeah. Right. The, right. But keeping families can together. families <clears throat> assume yeah. that you're going to try to keep them together because yes. at the Galvin, yes. we know the model does not allow for that. But at least at elementary and and high school, I think it seems is seemingly less problematic. Yeah. Um, Matt, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think just to you know answer part of Susie's question, like we're going to do everything we can to work with families to make this work for them right if there's a specific request you know we're going to do everything we can to meet requests because we understand kind of the situation and kind of how people's lives have been changed by all of this um and if there's a, a request that we can meet we're 100 percent going to try to meet that awesome thank you thank you um i actually just had one question in regards to um teacher prep time yeah. um you know, so that break, that hour and a half in between the day, how much time do the teachers get for lunch? And then um, do they get any prep time um, as well in there? Yeah. So our, our schedule does build in some specialist time during the, the long blocks that are in the morning. Um, so that would be a time that teachers would have available for some prep time, as well as that extended block in the middle of the day has room for their lunch time and some prep time as well. Okay, and then also I think you may have already answered this question in regards to the afternoon when the children go to school in the morning and they're home remotely in the afternoon. Um, are paras going to be available to possibly kind of assist kids to keep them engaged? Is that what was already answered? Absolutely, so we're gonna do everything we can to support our students um, with the adults we have in our building. So it, it's about figuring out what students are in which cohort and what those needs are. And then based on that, then we will kind of assign our adults and our, our staff, you know, appropriately to, to make students as successful as possible. And then I also just have one question that may be across the board in terms of attendance. Yeah. Um, you know, what is um, the accountability mm -hmm. in terms of the kids actually, like especially at the high school, when they're in school in the mornings and then when they leave for the afternoon, do they have to sign in and will attendance be taken in the afternoons? And then also how will attendance be taken during the day in the mornings mm -hmm. as well? So. One of the things that we're hearing from the Commissioner of Education and from the Department of Education is that uh, student time and student learning time needs to be accounted for, right? 
And so um, one of the things that at the secondary level, you know, in terms of students learning remotely, how do we account for that time? I think one of the kind of the, the biggest indicators is the completion of work, right? Completion of assignments and also participation with classmates during uh, remote activities, right? And so one of the things that I had mentioned earlier is, you know, some secondary, um, some high schools and, and some middle school, upper middle, are creating these assessment calendars where students and classes know that there are grades. So, you know, as we see students um, in person and as we look at their participation in remote instruction and the completion of student work, um, and we also look at um, kind of their performance on assessments and it's going to be different at different levels, right? And so that's not going to, at elementary, it would be a kind of developmental milestones or standards-based reference. At the middle and high school, it would be more traditional grading. Um, but that, that is going to be, has to be, not going to be, has to be part of um, our model, no, no matter what model we, we propose, right? And so whether it's hybrid or remote, that, that has to be a, a standard part of what we're doing. Okay. Um, I just had one more question for Adam, um, like at the Galvin, when, um, like if you bring in a fifth grade class, um, how are you going to socially distance all those students in a classroom? What, you know, will you split up, like, because I know there's two teachers to one class. Mm -hmm. Will half of the class go with one teacher and the other half go with the other, and then you have enough space within the school to do that uh, safely? Dude, that's a great question, Amy. Um, so what we're doing at the middle school level, for those familiar with the team concept, we're just creating bigger teams of adults to spread out students more. Uh, so on a typical team with your core academic teachers, we're going to partner them up with specialist teachers, and they're going to rotate through those classes with the specialists and academic teachers. And that's how we're going to bring down the class sizes per team. Uh, and so our class sizes right now at a max, with the max social distancing is 15 students per cohort. Uh, and so it'll st still be the team model, but our specialist teachers will join the teams, and that will help us reduce the class sizes. Great, thank Does that you. Your question, yeah, Amy? thank you for that clarity. Um, Mike, you had a question. Can I just add, oh, Adam? Uh, Adam uh, oh, sorry, Matt, um, Mike. I just think it might help to add to Amy's question. Adam, can you speak about um, so with that? Are are you looking at your spacing differently? I know we've talked about the spacing within, like spreading out um, among you know diff maybe different classrooms. Yeah, one of the advantages of not having two grades in the building is that we can spread out across. We have a, we have a wonderful facility with a lot of space. So by not having two grades in the building, uh, we're mapping out full use of our classrooms on those two days that students are in school. Um, so we feel really good about the, the physical space piece right now in, in our schedule. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yep, Mike. I have a question for Adam and for Amy, but Amy gets more time to answer it because I'll ask you first, Adam. Um, so uh, you both have done the same model where you have two days in a row, then either have a remote or, yeah. So the current model you both have has a situation where they meet two days in a row and then they have five days between the next time that they have an in-class experience. Five days. And if you changed it to, let's say Monday was one cohort, Tuesday was the other, Wednesday's remote, Thursday's cohort A again, B. The, the biggest gap you'll have is three days between an in-class experience for the kids. So my question is, is it more important to have those kids go two days in a row, or is it more important for them to have a short, the shortest possible time between class, in-class experiences? Yeah, I mean, it's a great point that you raised, Mike. I think in looking at the wide range of factors in building the week for us, um, you know, we looked at everything from the different cohorts coming in and out of the building over the course of the week. And so if we kept the same cohort of kids in Monday and Tuesday, I think the reason why the middle school, maybe the high school looked at Wednesday was to allow for a deep clean before another 500 students come into the building on Thursday and Friday. Uh, so that was one piece. And in the middle school model, we really are looking at the synchronous learning is not really a break of learning. I mean, it will be not in person, obviously, at the physical building. But it's really a straight learning experience right through. The only difference is either at the desk in person or on their device at home with their teacher. Um, and that's the synchronous piece that um, we're really prioritizing in the model. Amy, thoughts? Um, 
Yeah, somewhat, somewhat similarly though, the high school schedule looks different. Um, so if you're looking at the high school schedule, um, <coughs> students only see their teacher uh, because we are not teamed at the high school and students see six distinct teachers. They only see their teacher once over two days. Um, and so it's going to be a different experience for them for the two days and we wanted to sort of replicate that idea of going through your cycle um, of, of uh, classes A through F. Um, to make it similar to in-person learning. And I also think developmentally, um, I look at Wednesday as an in-person day. I know that it's gonna be remote, but it's gonna be synchronous learning. Kids are gonna be on there all day. There's a schedule that parents and teachers have asked for. Um, to answer Amy's earlier question, attendance is gonna be man mandatory those days, right? Those are not optional Zoom check-ins, so that is, that is uh, synchronous learning. Um, so I feel like the distance will be less. Um, and yeah, oh, I, I, it's a point well taken, right? I, I, but for me, I think it's a trade-off. I think the time between class experience allows the kids to take their learning that they've chunked in that, in that sort of experience and, and then um, work independently on the assignments or the activities that are, that are extending that learning till they have time to come back. So okay. I, think it's, I think it's a trade-off though, right? I mean, I, I, I yep. hear your question. Okay, thank you both. Uh, Susie. Um, Adam, if I can go back to Galvin, um, I'm trying not to be dense, but I'm, I'm having a really difficult time understanding how this is going to work at the Galvin. So you just, um, and Amy, you kind of started to ask the question, so, I, so you're going to team specialists with the core teachers, and there's a five period, there's five periods available. So are we saying that middle school students are gonna get all of their specialists, so they're going to get their four core classes and foreign language and tech ed and health and art and music, and that's how it ends up kind of being possible to do it the way that we're doing it? So in those two days over those five periods, I guess maybe if you could help me with what those five periods look like, and I don't have the schedule in front of me anymore because my computer died. Um, but if you could, I, I'm just having a difficult time, and, and I know there's a reason why you're doing fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth, um, and so I'm, I'm really trying to understand that because I know that that is creating a lot of angst for a lot of parents who have kids, multiple kids at the Galvin that fall into different cohorts. So I, I feel like we need to spend a little bit of time on this so that people can understand how this is gonna work. Sure, uh, I'll try to deconstruct a lot of what you asked right there. Um, again, kind of the overarching goal for the Galvin, the way we are splitting the week by grade level was really to provide live teaching, whether it's in person or from home. And that was what led to the grade level distribution, fifth and sixth, seventh and eighth. That's certainly open for, um, revisiting whether it's fifth and seventh, fifth and eighth, we can certainly go back and look at that. Um, to ask about kind of the breakdown of the day. So on a typical team at the Galvin, particularly in the upper grades, there's four cohorts, four cohorts on a team right now, going back to March. We're adding two more adults on the team to make it six cohorts. And that's bringing down our numbers, uh, class size numbers. So the staff that we're adding are specialists. So for example, uh, an eighth grade team um, we're gonna add an art teacher and a health teacher for conversation. And in the schedule that you're looking at, those, those groups of students, there's six groups of students on a team. It's a five period day. So similar to a high school model, we're gonna do a waterfall schedule. So students won't necessarily see all six teachers in one day. It'll rotate over two days. And that's another reason, Mike, why we're keeping students in together for two days in a row is we're creating 60 minute classes. We wanna really maximize time on learning with students, with adults. So our typical classes at the Galvin are 45 minutes. We're doing 60 minute classes, five periods. So the students that will have six, six different classes in their schedule, but any given day they'll only have five periods. And we're, we're working on schedules that have a rhyme or reason for how they uh, participate in those classes. And, and there's a lot of variables behind the scenes that we're working out right now. For the specialists, they'll have a certain length of time that they work with students on a particular team before they rotate to the next team. 
So students will have an opportunity to participate in a full range of specials that we offer. It's just gonna look a little different this year based on state guidelines of what students can do uh, in terms of some of the specials that we offer. Um, so we still wanted specials to be a, a lively part of their school day and have full access to specialists. That's why we are attaching them to teams of teachers uh, and we're gonna rotate them through. So I don't know, Susie, if that helps clarify things a little bit. That does, that helps a lot. Um, one additional question, so I think um, there was an assumption that if you're on, you get assigned to your team and you're, you're 15 kids, I had heard, you know, teachers are going to move into the classrooms. Kids aren't going to be moving. Is that really true in the in this case? If you've got you've got six teachers on a team, is it that those fifteen kids will stay together, or is there some variation to that because some kids are going to do music and some people do French, not Spanish, and right? So I'm assuming that there's some level of variation that will happen, but that the core classes, those kids are staying together. And I'm, I'm asking this question just more from a, a limit of um, exposure, you know, to how many kids are kids going to be exposed to? Yeah, great question. You know, when we looked at the state guidelines that were released from DESE about a month ago, the guidelines really emphasized limiting student movement throughout the building as much as possible, limiting intermingling with other cohorts of students as much as possible. So to start the year, we are looking um, to have students in groups of 15, um, particularly very much in the beginning of the year until everyone learns new routines and safe routines, keeping students somewhat stationary while building in movement breaks, while building in structured opportunities to move around the building. Um, but to, to your question, uh, a lot of that is our starting point to keep students with the same cohort uh, and to have teachers meet them in their space rather than releasing 600 students into the building when the period ends. Um, we didn't feel like that's a safe way to start the school year, given the size of Gallatin Middle School. Um, we wanted to really um, recreate a sense of community with students in the building, uh, retrain students on what safe behavior looks like at the middle school. And then once we feel like we have a good handle on that, you know, we're very much looking forward to uh, gradually uh, opening things up a little bit um, in our model. Perfect. Thank you. I have one more question, Adam, on a very important subject, lunch. So you're the only institution that will actually be having lunch in this new model. So it looks like you're going to break it into four different lunch sessions. Is that correct? That is correct. So, and they're going to eat, they're bringing their own lunch and eating in the cafeteria. How, you may have said it before. I apologize if I missed it, but how will that play out? Yeah, no problem. So in, in, in a typical school year, we run four lunches, one per grade level. So in this model, we're still going to run four lunches, but we're going to run two per grade level. Uh, and so that will cut the grade level in half. And we've been working with Bob Ciroli on what uh, capacity looks like in the cafeteria and the gym for students to have lunch. Certainly want to leverage outdoor weather in the fall to get students outside. Um, and again, th those will be really controlled movements in the building until you know we feel like things are very safe. Uh, we'll be working with food service on what purchasing lunch could look like, what are the options. Um, and, and so that, that's our game plan now. That was our probably our biggest hurdle was scheduling a lunch, um, but we felt that if we could schedule it, then then we should do it. Um, and so we're gonna have two lunches per grade level during the day to break down the numbers. Great, thank you. You're welcome. And Mike, just to jump in there, uh, cleaning in between lunches, um, you know, uh, have to give a big shout out to Tom Bankert. He made the suggestion to use disposable tablecloths in between each lunch. So then oh. you don't worry as much about um, disinfecting tabletops if you have if you have disposable tablecloths protecting them in between the students. How much time do you have between each lunch session? Yeah, so I think we've scheduled 15 minutes before, uh, between lunches. In, in our world, that's an eternity. Um, usually, <laughs> we have 30 seconds in between lunches. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're pretty confident with a 15 minute uh, gap that we can do a really good job cleaning. Great, thanks again. And just kind of go back to some of the questions that Susie had and other members. One of the advantages of having a weekly middle school principal group is that we shared our models with each other and every level elementary, middle and high school has different variables and unique needs of our students. And, you know, this isn't far off from some of the middle school models that we've been working with in our middle school group uh, in terms of how students are being cohorted and how their, uh, what their day looks like in terms of um, structure. So, you know, I just want to put that out there. Thank you, Adam. 
Um, I have um, a few questions for Amy um, in regards to the high school model. Um, uh, the first one is I, I see on the schedule that the homeroom is 20 minutes. I'm just wondering um, why it is so long and what may what will they be doing in that uh, homeroom session? Um, the second question is um, when the kids are remote, um, you know, do they have to follow the same time structure? So will they be logged in remotely for the 80 minutes? Um, and then the third question would be maybe once the schedules are done and um, things are sort of kind of ironing out, would they ever be able to possibly have those remote days work um, synchronous? Okay, I think I missed your third question, but I got your first two. So I'll, I'll have you run uh, through them again. Yep. Um, I'm actually, um, so, so for the first question, um, if you look, it, the way the schedule is done, students are actually gonna stay in the same room as their first law class um, for advisory, homeroom advisory. Um, the reason why we extended the time is a couple of things. Um, we thought that um, given where we're coming back from, um, and given what we know about um, social emotional learning um, in general, and the fact that we have been um, needing to go to have an advisory model at the high school, um, we thought that was never a better time than now to have a chunk of time built in at the beginning of the day um, to give teachers um, a few minutes to pause, um, to connect with kids, um, to see how they're feeling to start the day. Um, you know, if you look at the schedules across the district, um, um, elementary schools have meeting times, um, middle schools have built in advisory models and high schools generally say, hey, just start learning, you guys are fine, right? And we know that that's not good practice. Um, so we really feel like that advisory time gives students the time to have a gentle start to their morning, um, to make sure that we're checking in, see how the learning is going. Um, and it's also a way to go back to Mike's question. So when they come back in and haven't been in school for a number of days, um, I think it would be important to kind of get a sense of how have those days been when you've been out, what's working, what's not, um, and how can we kind of flex our, um, flex our learning. I, I'm going to just pause for one second and close my curtains because there's <laughs> my, my, neighbor's my neighbor's tree just fell on their house. We're having like a major storm oh here. Oh my Everybody's fine. Everybody's fine. Just give me a minute. Yeah. <laughs> sirens out there. So embarrassed. I'm sorry. Everybody's fine now. Um, a little so, distracting. Yeah, I'm like paying no attention to the blinking lights behind me. Sorry. Um, so, Susie, that's why I didn't hear, I'm, I'm sorry, Amy, that's why I didn't hear your third question, because I was seeing the lights flash. Tonight. Um, so, can you repeat the second and third question? Yes. Um, sorry. No, so the second question was, um, when the kids are remotely learning um, on those days that they're not in school, um, it, are they required to, like, log in? and actually have a remote session for 80 minutes or are those remote sessions shortened no so okay so the way that the schedule looks like it looks like they're logging in for those 80 minutes right because it's the way the schedule was designed um for looks right but on those two off days those days um go back to what i said earlier about the asynchronous learning mm -hmm. um i don't envision that most teachers would have kids logging in on those days at that time because they'll be teaching the other half of their class so they wouldn't be able to. Um, but what would be happening during that time is students, um, to go to what Doug was saying earlier when you asked that attendance question, is students' um, attendance can be tracked on those days by the work that they're gonna put in. Um, and I'll give an example of, say, um, an online blog where a teacher is gonna post a question, um, have students do a reading, um, and require them to engage in at least putting two or three responses onto that shared document or that shared blog, if you will, um, on, on that period. So that would demonstrate to a teacher that they've done a significant amount of work to check in on that day. Um, the Wednesdays are different. The yeah. Wednesdays would be the 40 minute, um, the, the period check-ins throughout the day timed. Um, so that could be counted easily, but the asynchronous would be less um, chunked out, out like that. However, if there was a student, so this is what I like about this schedule. If there, if you were a student who really needs a structured schedule in front of you, you could say to yourself, and I have a student like this at home um, who needs to know when they need to do their work on the asynchronous learning, they could follow that schedule from home and do their, their work during those time chunks. So it really could work in, in either way, and we would support students to kind of do that in a 
way that works for them. Yeah. Okay. And and my yeah, it does. And my third question was just, um, you know, once the kids are actually, um, you know, feeling more comfortable with the scheduling, is there any way that they could um, log in and, and and sync in with the class virtually if they needed to? I mean, is, is there a way for them to be able to do that possibly? So I'm going to defer back to Doug's answer. I think that um, as we uh, improve our technologies uh, and we improve um, teachers' ability to be able to flex with um, the kinds of learning that we know that kids can do, um, I think there will be some models at the high school where some teachers will be able to do that. Um, I'm not sure where all teachers do that. Um, Am I frozen again? Yeah, you're okay. okay. Yep, you're back. back. You're I don't have a lot of stuff going on here. I'm just <laughs> sorry. This is so embarrassing. You're quite enabled if you're living. Yeah, it's fine. As she's saying, as we improve technology. <laughs> it's, yeah. usually, it's usually very quiet here. So, um, <laughs> yeah. um, so we're just, we're just uh, so Amy, I was saying basically we're hoping that um, p potentially we could get to that model um, for some teachers in some classes. But again, I would say that um, you know that that's growth that that we that we need to do okay and so we're hoping that that will be a potential and maybe some teachers will be willing to pilot that uh, yeah. to start and we could see how that works yeah that'd be great if if, if um you, you could be open to possibly having that happen because it really is sort of the best approach for the students in my opinion um and the only um the last question i have maybe for doug like with this remote learning uh, model you know i just want to make sure that you know um it's very specific in terms of when the teachers are going to be available because I feel like in the spring you know nothing was really um, set in stone and teachers were kind of you know creating all these remote um, you know zoom yeah. classes all hours of the night and things like that so I just want to make sure that that isn't what is expected of the teachers yeah. um, I'm just gonna say it's a great day. segue I mean if we want to dig into the next slide that has yeah, all sure, those absolutely. details it's it's a great segue. Um, Can I ask one more question about oh, scheduling? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry, That's I can't okay. see I the Zoom screen yet. That's okay. No, I didn't raise my hand. It's my fault. So um, I know we're doing kind of a, a set week schedule now. Was there ever any consideration of doing two days on, two days off, two days on, two days off, where it's kind of a six-day schedule anyway? Or did we want to keep the schedule the same every week for planning purposes for parents? I just wanted to see if that was a consideration or not. Some schools are doing two days on, two days, two days off, meaning two days in class, two days remote, two days in class. It doesn't matter what day, it, it changes every week. Just curious if that was a consideration or not. So uh, I, I, can, I can share with you, Mike, I've, I've interacted with about 60 superintendents over the past two weeks. I haven't heard two days on, two days off. You know, we've heard every other week, um, which I, we looked, we discussed that, and and I think the feeling there was that there's just such a giant gap in time, you know, and the and the two days in the the two one two model that we're we're working with at the secondary level um, is is pretty common. A number of districts are are going with that model, um, and they feel like that's something that they can work with. A few of our surrounding districts are going with the every other week, and I understand their reasoning behind that. Um, but it just seems like such a tremendous gap in time to kind of get kids into a routine when they might potentially be out of school for nine or 10 days. Yeah, I don't disagree with you on that. I, yeah. St. John's is the one that I've heard that's doing it, Doug. It's the only one I've heard too, to be honest with you. I don't know if other private schools are. Chris, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no. I have a, a different question. It kind of revolves around all schools. Um, and and I, I guess there's some questions out in the public about what are we going to do about uh, testing for staff and students and how often is that going to be done and what's, what we have a plan for that. So that's going to be something that we discuss in an upcoming slide, but now as good a time as any, Chris, right? And, okay. and, and so um, one of the things, you know, for example, when, the, when Wakefield reopened, um, they made it available for all employees to be tested on a voluntary basis if they so wished. And so I think the plan in talking both with Steve Mayo and Ruth Clay <clears throat> would like to replicate that for school personnel as well. And so, but then, then that naturally leads into um, this kind of idea about um, how do we do contact tracing? Um, how do we handle 
symptomatic students or adults in schools. Um, and, and I can talk about that when we get to that slide, if that's okay, Chris. All right. Uh, Colleen had, looks like she has one more question. Yeah, it might be in a different slide um, under special education, but I had a question more directed towards uh, for Adam and Amy at the high school in the Galvin um, when it comes to IEP services. Uh, are we hoping to um, service uh, the students who are on IEPs? Uh, I would imagine you, we want to do this in person, but that may not be possible with the schedule that we have. So are we looking at a combination of remote services when appropriate? Um, so what, what can they look forward to, you know, in terms of their services? And obviously their IE plan, IEP plans have been changed remarkably like since the spring, but how are we gonna kind of bring that back together in terms of their services and when they're receiving them? Yep, um, I can speak to that at the high school. Um, I, we are looking to um, provide uh, those services in person. Um, and uh, Mary Beth Ebert, who is our uh, special education coordinator at the high school is actually looking at IEPs right now um, to see how they, they mesh with our new rotation of our schedule. Um, so LSCs fit into the rotation, uh, so students have their learning support services, um, and then um, other services that, uh, depending on the frequency of those LSCs, um, it may be something that we need to offer. We have those, those 90 minutes um, split into two 45 minute blocks after lunch where students are going to be, different groups of students will be staying on different days. Um, that is not our first um, pass at where we'd like um, special education supports to go, but that is another option. Um, so we are currently looking at that. Um, and then also the other thing that's shifting in our schedule is the blocks are longer. So if you have a 90 minute block and you're getting, uh, or an 80 minute block, sorry, and you're getting services in that block, um, does that then change the needs in the IEP? And that's an individually de decided student by student kind of situation. And so we're looking at that now, but um, we're hoping that all of our services or at least most of our services um, are able to be provided there. And then the question of when kids are remote on those days, could they come in in the afternoon for those services is a question we're looking at as, now as well. So we are exploring that. I don't have full answers just yet. No, that, that's good for now, thank you. And, and Colleen, my answer would be identical to Amy's. I mean, we're anticipating providing uh, as many in-person services as possible uh, in the way that we're grouping and scheduling students. And then we're looking at their off days on what, you know, what we can provide as well. Uh, and I, you know, I'd say our next step is so just gonna be more increased conversations, communication with specific families. Excellent, okay, thank you. I have one other question for Doug. Um, Doug, and you and I had a brief conversation on this a little while ago. So let's assume for argument's sake, we do go ahead with the hybrid approach. Yep. What criteria there would cause us to rethink that and perhaps go to a remote model? Um, so obviously if the governor um, called for all schools, as he did this past spring to close down, that would be one. The other would be um, kind of a, a local decision. So for example, this past March, Mike, we shut down ahead of the state, right? And so, you know, some districts are, are working um, in, in different ways to look at, you know, um, the data, look at, they want kind of science and the data to guide whether they're in or out of school. And, and we're absolutely open to that conversation. Um, for example, the transmission rates here in Wakefield, you know, are 0.83%, so we're below 1%. So it's, that's pretty darn good. I don't know um, if we can keep it in, in that area. I think we'll, we'll be in pretty good shape. Um, and so the, the, what would cause us to go full remote would be obviously a call from the governor or a call from my office as we did this past spring. Right, and so, and, and this touches on, I think th this intersects with Chris's question as well, which is, you know, what happens if you have uh, an adult or a student that's symptomatic, right? So, and how do you handle that at the school level? What do you do? And so, no matter what the, um, the numbers are, what our transmission rates are, if we have um, students that, or adults that are symptomatic, either in school or outside of school, um, what we will do is figure out who came in contact with that student or with that adult, um, and then we will respond accordingly. We have very detailed guidelines from the Department of Education. Um, we think you know we're going to make that that document only better and more user friendly, 
right? Because uh, we have Mary Doherty, our district nurse coordinator, working um, collaboratively with Kelly Quayley. Um, they're on our district reopening team, um, but they're also kind of heading up um, a group of nurses where they are going to go through um, the DESE guidance and we're gonna kind of create our own document for Wakefield so it's crystal clear about you know what, would, what we're doing and how we're gonna do it. Um, and even with that, Mike, if there is an exception that's not defined in, in the kind of the guidelines or the plan, we're gonna be pretty conservative, right? We're gonna be pretty conservative. For example, the guidance from the Department of Education talks in a very detailed way about, you know, if someone is symptomatic and they come within 10 feet of someone else for a given period of minutes. Um, and so a conservative approach to that would be, we're gonna look at that as an interaction or someone coming in contact. You know, we're not gonna break out the ruler and say it was seven feet, not eight feet, and it was nine minutes, not seven minutes. Like, we're just gonna say that we're gonna be conservative. We're gonna say if, if, if you're symptomatic and you came in contact with X number of people, those people are going home to quarantine, right? And we will kind of hook them up or connect them with our board of health, um, and we will support them in, in any way we can um, to kind of provide whatever we can for them, what whatever they need while they're out. And so that's that's a very it's a it's a short answer to a more detailed conversation. Sure, appreciate it. Thank you. Does anybody else have any uh, questions before Doug and Kara move on to the next section? I have a, um, a, two quick questions about the schedule. So Monday holidays, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of Monday holidays, <clears throat> right? Columbus Day, Veter well, Veterans Day isn't always a Monday. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but how are we handling holidays, especially when you talk about cohorts that are like the fifth, sixth grade that are Monday, Tuesday, or the cohort in high school that that's that's one of their days that they're in person. Has there been any discussion about that? There has. Um, there has not at, at the reopening team level, but there has been discussion in, in terms of talking about the calendar. Yeah. Right. And so one of the things that we need to do, and I, and I loved what Adam Colantoni said, which is, you know, this is a starting point for us, right? And, you know, we've, we've gotten several email already from the document and email that we released from earlier today and we've gotten questions like, if we start in a hybrid model um, and things continue to get better, could, will we expand that? Absolutely, the, absolutely, right? Um, if we start in a hybrid model and you know, we're working with teachers and students and we are, we are learning a better way to support learning, then are we gonna make that change? Absolutely, right? So this is not, this is a way for us to start school. Right, and so this is a way for us to start school. This is a beginning, um, and so that's something that I, I think Adam pointed out in his comments about the schedule. But um, that's that's an important piece. Okay, so yeah. for parents that are asking that question, we've got to take another look at the calendar. My, we do. My we secondary do. question to that was the PD days that were already scheduled in the existing calendar. If yeah. all of the PD days are happening on the front end. Does that mean, mean none of the PD <clears throat> days are happening during the year, or do you build in a couple of those because you might still need them? Um, but it, it sounds like there's an overall discussion that needs to be had around the calendar in general. So I, I will just answer the question quickly in regard to professional development days. The commissioner made the school year 170 days, and he's asked us to take 10 at the beginning of the year and block those and use all 10 to prepare adults to come back and students to come back into school safely. And so that's 10 days. We have two additional days um, that we have built in at the start of the school year. We're not gonna add those to the 10. We're gonna kind of put those in our pocket and kind of think about if, if, the, you know, if our plans shift or we need more time or we need to do some professional development, we might try to work that day in um, later in the calendar year. But we will put that in the calendar for families as a placeholder but it, that's, it could, it's subject to change based on the learning model that we're in, right? So that's two days, but there's a bunch of half days also in there. It so includes the half days as well. Okay. So, right, and so, so- parents don't need to worry about half days. 
on top of so I think, an already shortened learning yeah. day. I mean, I think in addition to the calendar, I mean, I think as a, as a district, we need to rethink professional development in general. Like, sure. gone are the days of gathering large groups of teachers right, right. into a space or, you know, I think there's a lot we need to think about too. And we've tried to be careful with the 10 days that the commissioner has given back to districts in terms of calling that professional development. Um, I think, you know, we really, th that's really time for teachers to prepare, get back in, prepare, and really think about safety protocols first. Um, I think we have to be conscientious of how our, you know, our teachers are going to come back and, you know, the, the many emotions with that and just yeah. the headspace for, um, professional development. I think we we do we will want it to be probably pretty interest based in terms of what we've been talking a lot, a lot about what teachers need at this point to start back at school and then you know plan accordingly. But I I do think that PD is just going to look really different this year. Agreed. Just, um, in general, and I think one of the pieces that I think you see in all the schedules is administrators really focused on when kids are in the building let's focus on kids and let's focus on our students and we've we've really let go a lot of of the you know not that we had a lot of um space holders in the in the um day but you know you talked about amy saying uh high school is giving up ascs which would in large part be you know study periods or we're really focused on having um a lot of time on learning when when kids are in the building and so um any planning plcs pd opportunities we're going to try to get outside of those student schedules. I appreciate the distinction between those first 10 days not being PD. Yeah, I, I appreciate I think it's you important. making that distinction because it, it's important for all of us to think of it yeah. that way. Yeah. We need to give teachers time mm -hmm. to get back and to reorient and to think, yes. and it's not PD. Right? The, it's not, that's not at all but, PD. That's about I'm, preparation. Right. It, it is going to be preparation, but there is we, we do need to squeeze some professional development in there. Okay. And I do think we're going to collaborate with teacher leaders to do that. I think we might do some equity, diversity, and inclusion work. Yep. Right. Um, Certainly, technique, te technology training. I think we're yeah, gonna. Right. There's gonna be some That's technology stuff. So, summer. so professional development. It might, it might feel like, and I know Chris is raising his hand. It might feel more like training than professional learning. Mm -hmm. Chris. During August, you know, teachers are allowed back into their rooms to prepare their rooms. Is that just not going to happen this year? And that's what these ten days are for. Um, so the plan and something that we're working on right now, Chris, is, and we're working with Bob Shiroli around trying to create a calendar, a predictable calendar of, of when we can let teachers back into the building. But, but we also need to do that with structure. Um, so teachers are, uh, so, so many of our teachers have taught so long with, with so many of their colleagues, um, you know, things like social distancing and safety is, is going to be an adjustment. Mm -hmm. I think our kids are going to rock with this pretty well, and it's going to be more of an adjustment for the adults. Um, but we're looking to do it, Chris, um, well before September 2nd, so adults can get in. So yes. But it won't be like it they've gotten in in the past. won't be that type of schedule. Does that answer your question? OK. Do we want to allow our principals to sign off, or do you think it's safer to be in? Yeah. So, uh, Carrie just made a, a great point. I, you know, it's, it's about 9 o'clock. Um, I just wanted to just ask our principals if they have any closing remarks, and we can let you guys sign off, and, and then Karen and I can, and Christine and, and Bob can finish the slideshow or the presentation. Any, any closing Thank thoughts? <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you guys. for their questions tonight, thoughtful questions. I know we have a, a large audience um, watching. Uh, all of our principals, uh, we're just excited to get our school communities back. And we just we need a starting point, and there's a lot of information to digest. And, and these plans are very fluid, um, but we need a starting point to just think about recreating our communities and our schools. So just appreciate the time tonight. We look forward to meeting with our school communities this week. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Should we move? Yep. Okay. So, oh, Chris, did you have another question or are you waving? <laughs> <You're on> mute. <laughs> okay, so I think we can move on. All right. Um, so, we'd just like to move ahead in the slideshow. So, the third plan that we created was a remote plan. And, and you know, one of the things, one of the questions that came up, Amy asked this question about 
schedules and how critical schedule schedules are. You'll see at kind of halfway down the slide, um, we've shared this and we've used this exact language. You know, things uh, for remote instruction model will be more robust in the fall now, right, as the remote part, either as a standalone or as a, the part of our hybrid model, right? It needs to be, schedules need to be predictable, routine for, for and routines for families and students, right? Communication needs to be more consistent. Um, technology tools need to be more accessible. And so, um, and I know Christine is gonna talk a little bit more about technology, um, but I, I feel like in our, I feel like we've covered almost all of this. I don't yeah. know if anyone has any questions about any of the bullets on this slide. <laughs> I, I feel like we've, we've talked at least once or twice about every one of them. Hey, Doug. Yes, sir. One thing that it kind of kind of gnaws at me is this remote learning academy yeah. description. It's almost like we're segregating these people into a different bucket. Yeah. Right. You know, it just doesn't feel right. They yep. should all be somehow brought together. So I don't know. You really want to have a specific program for that, or just say hey, there are kids that are doing remote. Um, just. It, I don't know, something bothers me about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so it, I'm glad you made that distinction, Mike, because I don't know that that's clear for our viewers at, our viewers at home, right? Mm -hmm. And so in, in addition to the plans that districts and superintendents and administrators were asked to create, these three plans, um, the Department of Education has also said that parents have a right um, to just say to just opt out of a plan and say I'm going to I'm going to uh, go remote, and then it's up to the district to figure out how to structure um, what that might look like, right? And so it's a it's an so conceptually I think when us calling it um, a remote academy is just a way to try to create a structure, Mike, and not to segregate or create something different. But just to try to create some structure around, if a student is in a hybrid, we we they're we're accounting for them differently than if a student is in a remote model, right? And so, and the other part of this, Mike, is, is that districts are not being given additional money to hire a whole new remote faculty, right? And so it's it's we're trying to kind of balance with the resources that we have to create services that are really improved over what we did last spring, right? So it, it's not meant to segregate. So just just a little bit of information yeah. behind that. Just, but I just, I, that, that age group has a sensitivity to get having labels attached to them. No, I, and I think you don't want to do anything to make it negative. Yeah. Point, point is well taken. Good point. You know, but, but again, just to be clear, our remote, the students that are, will be opting into a remote, full remote plan, um, will range from K through 12, right? So just, a, just an FYI, and we'll be able to report more on that. And Great, thank you. For clarity, they will not be assigned to teams, hybrid teams with hybrid teachers. They are going to be experiencing through, with different instruct, instructors that are all online in a different schedule with different teachers than the hybrid teachers. So it's not like they're zooming in to a, a class be. that's being um, so, yeah. taught live because we've already determined that that's really difficult and isn't necessarily a, a thing that teachers are, you know, I, I had a conversation with a middle school right. teacher about this and she's like, it is really hard to teach a class and teach um, kids remotely at the same time like right. that is a real skill mm -hmm. and then you have the you know you have the privacy and the confidentiality um, uh, piece to consider but one of the things that we talked about and in Mike you're right we, we, we're still you know first of all we have to figure out who our population is is going to choose this and we've we've been taking many phone calls from parents who are either choosing um, are, are really kind of struggling do I go the homeschool route which would mean unenroll create my own program go by my own schedule or see what the district has to offer on the remote side of things so so we're talking that through with families as they're making those decisions but one of the things that we talked about was was still giving you know every student a spot on a team because we're not sure that we're prepared to say you know you can't flex back in if your family feels like you're ready 
to come back now? Like if there's nervousness in the start of the year and your family chooses full remote, we don't want to box people out and say, um, you know, I, I think just philosophically, we don't feel good about that right now to say, you know, you choose this, you choose it for the year, there's no way out. Because I think everybody right now, we keep saying everyone has to be flexible, so we have to be flexible too. Yeah. And um, so that's where we talked about, um, you know, giving all of our kids spots on a team if, if they may choose. That's great. To that, that was kind of a, another question I had was, so, can you flex in and out? Right. Well, it's, well, we don't want students flexing in and out yeah. like at their leisure. <laughs> yeah, right. but, but we, I'm right. not that flexible. But we, but we do want to make space, right? And so, right. but this for us in, in regard to our planning and our thinking is falls in the same line with questions about special education, right? And so if we're on, you know, a middle school plan or a high school plan um, that is a two one two, you know, student one cohort in Monday, Tuesday, and one cohort in Thursday, Friday. You know, if we have a student that has is in a special education program or has needs, um, that student might be in in school more than just the two days, yeah. right? I mean, we need to think um, a little bit more um, expansively around you know the needs of kids. So this falls into the equity kind of line or of thinking. Right, which is, you know, the redistribution, the reallocation of resources is not enough, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so we're we're thinking about, um, really, how do we get to kids, and what success are they having? Yeah. And so, and I, I'm really pleased that that all the principals that spoke tonight talked about, you know, Amy McLeod talked about high school being different than middle school, but also talked about making time at the beginning of the day just to get eyes on kids and check in with kids, right? Mm -hmm. That's not a small thing. And a lot of high schools are not doing that, right? Um, it's like instructional minutes, instructional minutes, instructional minutes. So, and I, and I think at every level that's being prioritized. And so that's just a little bit more information in regard to what kind of some of the underpinnings are behind our planning, right? So I, I think yeah, I think we can skip it. Um, and, and I think we can be brief on this slide as well. Um, we just wanted to, to touch upon the technology. And I've talked to the committee, I think at, at our last meeting we touched upon, and it's within the reopening doc as well, just the need, um, the priority for us to do uh, less better. Um, we really t um, broke down what instructional tools and platforms we felt were most effective, and we're trying to um, create that consistency for staff and students and you know I just really wanted to commend the work that, that Christine did in terms of the budget in the spring really helping us to prioritize those technology tools so Christine I don't know if you want to speak a little bit to that sure J just briefly all of these plans hinge on a significant investment in technology so we were looking at um, to date we've purchased over a thousand devices Chromebooks um, charging carts iPads, laptops, trying to meet all, all students at different levels. We've also um, purchased Zoom licenses for everyone in the district, Google Cla Classroom. Um, I also um, happy to report we were a recipient of the technology grant we found out this week. At, this week. So we received about $66,000 in addition um, to the investments we've made to date. So we're gonna be spending that probably this week. <laughs> um, it goes so fast. Um, but yeah, so we've been working for a curriculum, for devices, but it's really to support the, the synchronous learning in the asynchronous learning. Now, of course, there's some training that has to go along with that, but um, more to come for that. Um, I don't know if anyone has any Mike questions. Has Mike, Mike yeah. has sure. Has a question. Christine, Christine, so how are you feeling about our budget at this point? So we're lucky that we received the CARES Act grant. We received a couple of, you know, but, you know, we have more work to do. Yeah. I know we're trying to get money from the state. Right. All this stuff. The so. commissioner has talked about more federal stimulus money coming. So um, we haven't heard definitely. And the state really haven't, hasn't even set their budget yet. So, you know, we still have to, you know, we have a, a final number right now for Chapter 70. We look like we've been level funded in that respect. Um, and we just have, we're applying for every grant that's out there, everything that we can, that we can try. But, um, you know, we're, we're hoping to do the best we can. I see that Chris, ha Chris has a question. Yeah. 
Somebody had a, an email from Jason Lewis like yesterday that said our Chapter 70 was up like almost $900,000. So the chapter 70 was only up by $24,000. The 900,000 includes the CARES Act grant and the COVID relief grant. Oh, they didn't word it that mm -hmm. I know, I know. It made it look like chapter 70 <laughs> was up, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's one-time funding from the federal government. It, so. it, it did look that way, Chris. Right. That was a little little sleight of hand. No. Um, very no. well presented, but if you look a little deeper, not right. so much. I, I, just, I read it for what it said. I didn't think it was going to be in the No? It, it's, on the des, it's on the DESI website, website <clears throat> by district, but yeah, they really drilled it down. Thank you. So we, we're also collaborating with um, Steve Mayo and you know the leaders on the town side we're keeping track of of all all expenditures related to uh the pandemic and to kind of our modified schedule right and and like christine said i don't i don't think that she's really doing this justice right so we have a standing meeting um with our finance subcommittee every thursday morning um again we keep we're applying for every grant um, public grants, we're applying for private grants. You know, the Wakefield Education Foundation um, has just granted us um, $25,000 to support us with technology. Um, and so, which is really just um, so amazing, you know? And, and so um, we're, so we're, in terms of opening school, I think we're in good shape. We do need to pay very close attention um, to our overall budget, and I think we should be good. I think there are questions. There are a lot, of, lot more questions and answers right now around things like um, extracurricular activities, mm -hmm. sports. Um, you know, if, if, if we start school in a remote model, chances are pretty good that there will be no fall athletics um, or extracurricular activities. Um, and so, and that's gonna be a significant loss for students and families. And, and I don't like want to I say assume, to students. Sorry, I assume if we start in a hybrid and we go to remote, then all athletics will stop at that point in time too. Is that your best guess as well? Right. Well, I, you know, the commissioner, the governor, and the commissioner both use the same same language, Mike. When they say mm -hmm. if if we're reopening and we're well enough to be in school, then it's a conversation about sports and extracurricular. But you know, if if we're in, you know, and the other piece that that is that is uh, that's real is you know who's initiating the remote right the, the the idea that we go remote you know if we go remote because we need to because of the pandemic or because the governor has required us to quarantine that's a different situation than us simply starting in a remote right and so and i think that that's viewed very differently um by the leaders at the department of education and, and the leaders at the state as well so great thank you sure so I think we can transition yep. to the facilities yep. and um, safety preparation slide, which um, we have Bob here to help us speak to some of those points. Sure, thanks, Kenna. Um, so to preface, uh, before I go through these bullets, everything we've been um, preparing to do uh, for facilities has been based off of safety and, and trying to make schools the safest place available for students, teachers, um, students, staff, and families um, to return. So uh, first and foremost, PPE. Um, we've purchased uh, roughly 12 weeks worth of PPE and, and you know, we'll reassess as, it, as if we come back on a hybrid model and as it moves forward. Um, PPE that we've purchased is, you know, of course, in order to ensure the safety and wellness of staff, students, and families. Um, we've, in, in accordance with CDC and DESE guidelines, we've purchased the supplies for the upcoming fall but also been providing it to the staff and students in our summer school program at the Woodville. Um, the PPE we've purchased has been disposable masks, disposable gloves, disposable gowns, face shields, hand sanitizer, disinfectant spray. Um, so with all this, we'll be handing it out pretty much on a weekly basis as needed um, when, when students and staff come back. Um, we are going to be putting cleaning stations in each room throughout the school and at frequently used entrances, um, just so we have anything that people need to stay 
uh, you know, healthy user user hand sanitizer and also make sure soap and everything is, is fully stocked in the bathrooms um, for when people need to, to wash. Um, other notable items that we've also purchased has been touchless thermometers for the nurses um, and electrostatic sprayers. We plan on using the electrostatic sprayers um, to do our deep disinfectant. I'll talk about that in a further bullet point. Um, we have purchased these for each school has their own, um, so we don't have to worry about um, sharing in, in that, that retrospect. These, uh, the electrostatic sprayers, they're not, they're not cheap, but then they're also very, very hard to come by uh, at this point. So it's pretty good that we, uh, we have them um, on hand. Um, as Doug mentioned earlier, we are increasing our custodial staff. We currently have two offers to candidates for one year custodial positions. These additional roles will be valuable assets um, to assist with the additional cleaning disinfecting that will be needed moving forward. Um, I guess one of the one of the most popular questions that I've been getting has been right ventilation, air quality, and cleaning protocols, and, and I'll discuss those in the next two bullet points. Um, so ventilation and air quality. We conducted uh, indoor air quality testing uh, by requ request through the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, not that we knew COVID was going to happen, uh, but our foresight allowed us to conduct these IAQ tests prior to the outbreak. Um, we were able to do so in five of the seven schools. Um, and we started at the high school in April of 2019. And our last test was at Galvin on February 13th. Um, and, and in between these tests, we also conducted the IAQ tests at Greenwood, Woodville, and Doyle. Um, we were planning on doing the other two schools, Dole Bear and Walton. Um, this spring, but unfortunately, uh, DPH is a, is pretty busy right now and can't get out to do that. Um, so the, so the two big, the, the IQ test, the two big suggestions that DPH suggested is, and this is even prior to COVID is to open windows for fresh air for areas that don't have adequate HVAC ventilation. Um, and also to not block unit vents right, the intake and the supply. Um, so in, with, with the ventilation air quality, the Wakefield DPW hired a new HVAC tech. He started about a month and a half, two months ago, and he's been assessing all the town buildings, including the school's HVAC systems to ensure they're working to the best functionality. Um, we, Doug and I and, and, we, and Christine, we have a standing meeting with the DPW to discuss HVAC and our reopening plans. And they've been great partners um, helping us uh, work through this. I would just like to chime in too. We've also purchased plexiglass for all of the schools, for the main office, for the lunch um, lines. And um, Bob has also worked with all of the schools um, for signage about social distancing, um, what areas to walk in, in certain ways for the hallways. So it's been uh, quite a collaboration. Will the hallways be one way? So we've purchased, do you want to speak to that, Bob? Sure. For the plans that the high school is planning on doing one-way hallways, um, all the other mm -hmm. schools are not, but we're going to put uh, tape down the middle of the hallways to kind of make it similar to a, to a road where you go, you walk one way um, while, while students are walking in the opposite direction. Can I ask a question that's related to that? How yeah. are we planning on monitoring or policing kids wearing masks and social distancing? Are we going to have hall monitors? in the in the middle school and the high school or you, know, you can't be going in the bathroom with with the kids or anything of that sort so are we planning on stepping up our monitoring of compliance with these kids in the hallways i assume the teachers will do it in the classrooms so i think i could take that question mike and so the, the plan would be that when students are passing you know teachers are present in the hallway and and kind of attentive to students during unstructured times you heard at the middle level that there's not going to be much passing. You know, at the high school, you know, teachers will be about to the to the degree that they can be, and administrators certainly will be, right? And and we are anticipating, Mike, that the kids are going to be really good rule followers, right? You know, I, I think we, you know, unless someone's doing a social protest, that they're not going to wear their mask, and 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 you know, and we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I certainly don't want to prompt that, but. Um, you know, we're assuming that, that kids know that they have a role in keeping themselves safe, 
and keeping other people safe. And we think that they're going to act accordingly. Mm. You know, we, we have kids right now in our summer program, Mike, and, and yeah. all of them, all of them to a person, they're, they fall, they're following the rules brilliantly. Now, they're only our younger guys, um, you know, but, but again, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And, uh, you know, I, again, the kids understand pretty well that this is a pandemic and, and safety is critical. Um, and kids have taken direction pretty well. And I think, to be honest with you, I think that they're just so excited to be back in any yeah. way that they can be. I, I think it's, it's going to go well in regard to the students. Yeah, if I, could, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I don't think anyone wants to be the one who causes us to have to go back to remote. Yeah. So hopefully that will help. If, if I can just add to that, too, one of the pieces of continued planning that we're talking about is related to our student handbooks, and we have student handbooks at every level, and, and the point of, of those handbooks is really you know, to keep our schools and our community safe, and I think we all agree that there are going to be additional um, revisions to those handbooks for the 2021 school year, um, just to be thinking about how we partner with students and families to keep all of our um, you know our whole community safe and again you know what we put in print i think we're all realistic to know that if you put it in writing you know it's not it's not as easy live in action but i think um i agree with doug that i think we'll have a lot of co uh, cooperation around that yeah you know one of our drivers i want to be co completely clear one of our drivers is high expectations for everyone that's in our system right and so i i think that you know, everyone knows that they're not coming back to the jobs that they left, right? And so everyone knows that, you know, and Rick Manzi, one of the WA leaders likes to say, mm -hmm. this is an all hands event, right? This is not what we left, this is an all hands event. And, I, and it is, right? And so people are gonna have to um, do things differently. And, and our working theory, based on the work that we've done so far, is that people are, are more than willing um, to really partake and to, to kind of create learning opportunities for kids in any way that they can, as long as it's safe. So that's just a quick. I just had one more question for Bob um, in terms of um, cleaning the bathrooms. Um, can you explain maybe how you plan to do that and is there a program uh, district-wide throughout the day? Um, yeah, so so we're working on those and it, it, it really depends on each school's schedule right um so we're gonna have to close bathrooms down throughout the day as, as frequently as we can we're gonna have to look at the schedules um when students are in classrooms or, or what their what their breaks are um so we're, so we're really gonna have to try to do that but one thing that we're we're looking for and waiting on is a little guidance from the from the state um and that's the the mass facilities association um we are we're that i'm involved in we're looking at all the districts are trying to collaborate and, and come up with cleaning protocols that we could share um, statewide. So it's kind of not just this district, this district's doing this, that district's doing that. We're trying to collaborate together to to, to get cleaning protocols. Um, like you asked, Amy, I mean, right, what is the what is the the plan? But if we if we are cleaning throughout the day, we're gonna have to shut bathrooms down. And, and does that stop um, students and staff from going to wash their hands more frequently, right? You have to ask that question as well. Um, so there's there, there's kind of a, a give and take on, on, on what you do with each protocol. Great, thank you. Yep. Uh, anybody else have any other questions? All right, you can move on. So we just have a few more slides. Um, our next slide up is, is about nurses and medical support. And so we, we are hiring, um, right now we have a job posted for one additional nurse. Um, we've hired a nurse for our summer program and we also have um, contracted with another, a second nurse to support our summer programming as well. And so over at Woodville, we're providing services to 41 students um, and we have two nurses there um, and, and our faculty and staff are there. We also have um, students working there in the summer supporting um, classrooms as well. So that's gone exceptionally well. Um, I've talked a little bit about protocols in, for symptomatic students. We'll be publishing that. We'll be putting that on our website. And so um, as soon as we get that completed. And so in terms of contact tracing, that will not fall to our school nurses. Um, that will be done by the Board of Health. And um, I'm 
Ruth Clay joined our, our call earlier today um, for our district reopening team um, and will continue to be kind of a contact for us. And so, and we also, whenever we have questions, we don't kind of hesitate to call um, the State Board of Health as well. And so we'll, we'll continue to do that. And so that's a quick there. Um, additional planning and consideration. Doug, so, could I only, only while we're on that private high slide. So we're in school, a kid says they don't feel well. Yep. Obviously we're not gonna know the symptomatic because they haven't been tested yet. What's the protocol going to be in our new environment about or an adult for that matter? Well, it de depends what symptoms that they have, Mike. Not all symptoms are, you know, I think that there are, there are eight or 10 symptoms that, you know, we, we look for that are indicators of, of COVID, right? And so if we have a first grader that's down after snack because, you know, they've eaten too much, um, <laughs> then I think we need to kind of differentiate between what is, what is a symptomatic situation that we need to respond to. Um, but if someone is symptomatic, Mike, um, we, will, we would quarantine them in, in school. There's a, there will be a designated space to quarantine students. Um, they would be supervised um, by, by, by our personnel um, until they are picked up um, and, and use the nurse. Our nurses will be um, wearing PPEs, right? And so if, if they know that a student is symptomatic, um, they'll, my guess is, and in, in, I haven't worked this out with Mary and, and Kelly yet, but they would probably increase the level of, of protection that they have on um, while they're supervising the student and make sure that the student kind of gets where they belong so that they can be tested and cared for. Um, and then the next part of that is we will figure out who that student came in contact with um, and we would kind of make kind of the, the option for them, not the option, but we would make it so that they can, they could, they too could quarantine for the 14 day limit, right? And so we would, and we would go from there, right? Thank you very much. Sure. Again, Mike, I'm giving a short answer to a more detailed scenario, and, and, and so we're, we're going to have more information on that. Sure. Okay. So additional mm -hmm. planning consideration, the things that we're looking at. Um, we are looking at, um, so additional time, um, studies to further refine cleaning. And so, um, thanks. So Bob will... Um, this is kind of the time study piece. And so Bob will go over that. We're looking very closely at kind of professional learning for our phase one in regard what, are the, what does that 10 days look like? Uh, every time we talk to the Department of Education, they add something new to the 10 days. So we're, we're just really trying to prioritize and we will work that out with our WEA leaders as well. And so, you know, transportation, um, the new guidance that we got from the state is really requiring that that we prioritize who will be allowed to get on buses right in the past we had you know over 400 riders mm -hmm. on nine buses and so now with our we still only have nine buses contracted to come to to wakefield um, and they serve different schools so they'll be cleaned in between runs but with our social distancing requ requirements um, we can we're only going to be able to put you know 18 to 20 students on a bus that used to hold 57 students. So that's gonna require us, like other districts, to prioritize who absolutely needs to be on that bus. And so obviously we'll be providing transportation for special education students um, who, who need that in their IEP. Um, and we will also be providing transportation for students in grades K through six that live two miles or more away from their, their home school. And so, and if, if we, if those restrictions are eased up, <clears throat> we would obviously add uh, more students to the bus as that becomes um, a possibility for us. As I shared, we continue to consult with the Board of Health on schedules and protocols. The information that we're presenting to you, we've shared with them. It's kind of just like our graduation plans, just like any of our gathering plans, right? The information that we're sharing here has been seen by um, by Ruth and so Ruth Clay that is and so there's a lot of, of work and a lot of questions that that we need to do our plan for 
kind of the, in the coming weeks and, and certainly our plan leading up to our meeting on the 12th is going to be to, we're going to meet with cohorts of parents at the elementary middle and high school we have three zoom calls scheduled um, we might schedule another event if we can squeeze it in this week um, and we are going to go through all of the email that we get and all of the questions we're going to group those questions together and create a frequently asked questions document and address um, as many concerns as we possibly can um, uh, in the timeline before we come back on the 12th and so in the plan for us to come back on the 12th and I'm and I've talked to Amy about this is um, for us to make whatever adjustments that we need to make to our plans um, and to share those adjustments when we come back on the 12th and give the committee an opportunity um, to endorse a plan right and so and and this is a critical piece and and we can talk more about this but you know the school committee will be endorsing essentially a concept for us to start school we know that what we start with we may have to change in a moment's notice and we know if things continue to trend in a positive direction we would obviously expand as we as we could do safely um, into a, a better more robust model to meet the needs of students and so that's that's the quick um, in terms of closing remarks I think I, I hope that you can hear my words when I say this you know our administrative team our teacher leaders and I think I speak for most of of the personnel who work for the Wakefield Public Schools <clears throat> you know we are absolutely committed absolutely committed to provide learning opportunities with integrity and structure for all of our students like that that's our job right now it doesn't matter what model we're in our job is to create learning opportunities for kids it doesn't matter if we're in remote hybrid or in person right and so that's kind of our mindset and that's how we're going at this you know the foundation of this commitment is, is really based on relationships trust and communication um, which is more critical now than ever before right there's everyone's so anxious um, there's a lot of anxiety and fear um, and, and misinformation about you know what it means to come back what it means not to come back and so we hope to be a resource um, not only for the committee but for the community um, to address questions that you might have <clears throat> um, to best support you and your children so um, that's it I don't know if anyone has any final questions Tom Hi, uh, so uh, first of all, certainly uh, thank you, uh, Doug and Kara and the entire team, all the principals that, uh, that were with us earlier and everyone <clears throat> that constituted the working groups throughout the summer to get us to where we are tonight. <clears throat> An incredible amount of work and uh, incredible uh, um, thoughtfulness. One of the things I think that's most impressive to me is the level of thoughtfulness um, and even Doug in your closing remarks talking about integrity and structure. Um, then that certainly, in my view, uh, very much shined through um, in the in this work. Um, I hadn't uh, actually said anything earlier. My colleagues asked uh, probably all, if not more, of the questions that I could even think of. Uh, but I did have a couple with related to the last couple of slides, um, if I if I may. Of course. Uh, but one was about the the technology piece. I know that that Christine mentioned. Um, uh, one, one, we certainly got when we're getting the sixty-six thousand dollar grant for technology. That's that is uh, that is great news. So congratulations on receiving that additional additional grant. Uh, one of the things that um, around technology, but it's also a larger picture question, which doesn't have to be part of tonight, but could be part of next week, um, is the sharing of the data from the survey with regard to the questions actually asked. I think it was tremendously important as part of tonight's presentation to share with us sort of the, uh, the demographic breakdown of um, who responded and you know what from what schools and what categories and parents and staff and, and so forth. And I think that was, that was incredible. I think the number of people that responded was also uh, very impressive, uh, which obviously speaks to the fact that lots of people in town, parents and others are really paying attention to this, which is, which is critical news as well. 
So one of my questions around technology um, are is from the surveys, did we pick up anything? Uh, I know one of the survey questions, because I as a parent answered uh, that question, <clears throat> or the survey rather. What did we pick up with regard to needs of, of either technology devices or lack of infrastructure in people's homes? Uh, that's something that, that I know that we're, 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 you know, certainly very open to providing devices. That's been part of our policy for years. Uh, we've, we've put an awful lot of resources uh, and funding into devices in the last decade, never mind the last couple of years. So uh, if you could speak to what do we anticipate being some of the needs for technology supports for kids at home? And, and, and what, what sort of shined through from some of the, uh, the survey data with, with regard to that? Um, sure. Tom, I can jump in on that and just give, uh, you know, I, I don't have the um, survey results right in front of me, but from um, going through it, I think we, we broke it out based on what families had access to um, for internet and whether or not they needed devices. I felt like the internet piece, um, I think we were at like 99% of respondents had access to internet in the home. Um, so the internet um, connectivity piece wasn't as much of an issue, but devices, I think having the right device to connect uh, to Zoom, um, if there was multiple um, children in the home, you know, that could be challenging. And I know that we met some of those needs within, within the spring, too, and we worked with families um, to distribute as many Chromebooks as we could, um, which I think was well over 100, Christine, if I'm yes. correct, um, in the spring. So um, we, we responded to all kinds of requests, whether, you know, people didn't have a device at all in the home or um, maybe you know need an additional one um we, we loaned those out as well and i anticipate you know with the priorities that we've made in terms of uh purchasing technology that we'll continue to work with families based on on their needs within the homes and distribute as many as we can great and i think that 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 is is um it's certainly great news and wonderful news i want to make sure that <clears throat> um, in the process we are completely open and constantly uh, reminding uh, parents and students of the availability for technology. Right. I think it's entirely appropriate, you know, in the big picture that we raise the bar on ourselves, we raise the bar on our teachers, and of course raising the bar on the students as far as being able to provide the best education within the confines of the safe environment that we can. And if technology is one of those things that is becoming an obstacle, we want to, we have the means to not have that Right. be as, as big an obstacle as possible. So um, I'm thrilled to hear that to hear that answer. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things, um, if we could, again, not, not tonight, because I appreciate one, the hour, and two, it wasn't part of the agenda. So I don't mean to complicate that. But if, if you could share with the committee and perhaps the community as a whole what some of the responses to, this, to the survey was. I'm not interested necessarily in digging in to the aggregate data or, or doing any data mining, per se. Uh, that's for sure. I don't want to exaggerate that point, but I think it's important uh, for all of us to uh, share um, in the results that the community obviously responded, the school community responded uh, in, in earnest um, to, uh, to what we've asked for for survey questions. Um, and I would, I'd love to see, and I, I bet my colleagues would as well, love to see what the results of some of that, uh, some of those survey uh, results were. Um, Next, next topic is transportation um, uh, 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 for Doug or Christine or anyone, really. Um, I fully appreciate, Doug, during your remarks on transportation on the last slide or second to last slide, um, that there are certainly, you know, there are, there are limitations. We, there are limitations within our contract with the bus company. There are limitations within our requirements. There are limitations in what we're obliged to do, right? Um, uh, it, it, is this one of those, um, I know that also the transportation was a survey question out there. So it's, it's probably going to be a little bit on the heels of the, the last uh, type of, you know, what data we may have collected with regard to uh, transportation needs. Um, one, are we anticipating more transportation needs than, than we're prepared for? And I just don't mean cutting the number of, of riders by more than half. I mean, um, do we think we may have been receiving more um, requests for transportation this year than, than in the past? Um, and, you know, and or 
Um, is there any possibility of, with the bus company, uh, the possibility of increasing the number of, of buses and, um, that we may have available to provide transportation in the district? You know, we are, you know, obviously going forward with some of the models, some one of the models presented, if not a combination of all of them, and transportation is going to be a critical piece. Um, we need to get the kids, uh, you know, in, into the building safely, and perhaps as importantly, if not more importantly, because of the varying times of day, get the kids home safely. Um, so the transportation is, is my second question, then I'll hop into my third, and then I'll let, let you answer, Doug. My third question is, could you speak to uh, what is the DESE uh, review and approval process? I know that you had to submit the plans mm -hmm. ahead of tonight's meeting, which is entirely reasonable. Yes. Uh, we're going to be voting uh, next week, uh, at which you will inform the commissioner of, of that result. Um, what, what, do we, what can we then expect from, from DESE with regard to their review and approval process? Thank you. Sure. Um, so we're hearing that the Department of Education is going to give us feedback on the preliminary um, text that we provided in terms of what plan we would like to come back in. So, so the infra, we've so these slides that we presented this evening, we've summarized that in a very short amount of text. So the Department of Education asked us for a preliminary um, or a draft of of <clears throat> the feasibility work that our reopening teams has, had done. And we provided that last Friday, okay? And it was really, it's a form tool that the Department of Education used. And so it's literally like you're checking boxes. It's like taking a survey. Checking boxes where there were fill-ins, you could only put in so much text, 300 words, you know? So it's, it's a, um, a far condensed version of the, the report that we shared with the community today and we shared with the school committee yesterday, right? And so... Um, so that we provided them that they they have shared with us that they're going to provide us feedback on the information that we've provided, um, and then in, then in terms of our plan, so plans are due to the to the Department of Ed the first really the first two weeks in August, August 10th is when they're asking for them. You know I've shared with Jeff Riley that our school committee is voting on the 12th. He said not a problem. You can get it to me. You know after your vote on the 13th or the 14th. And so that's, that's our plan right now. Um, but in terms of them giving us feedback on the final plan, um, I, you know, I think the questions that they're gonna have are things are, are around accountability and, and what plan we will be starting in. And so we are, we are kind of hearing um, that they're kind of, they will do whatever they can to support districts to get students back into schools. And so, um, and so I think that they're, they will be very flexible to try to support districts to help us get back. Um, if, if districts are starting in a remote plan, not because of the spread of the virus or because the governor has required us to, to quarantine, I think that they're gonna be a little bit more parochial in what they're going to be asking us to do and understanding um, why we need to do that and how we are really providing the best service for our kids. So we might get additional feedback if we were to start in the plan other than hybrid. Um, but that's basically what we're hearing right now. In terms of next week, Tom, um, what we will be required to do, again, I think w what we would be asking of the committee, and, and this legal counsel has also kind of provided us a perspective on this, to kind of take the pressure off of the committee a little bit, is to say that, that the committee is endorsing a concept, right? They're endorsing a safe return to school. Safe, again, safety is, is critical. They're, they're endorsing a safe return to school in a model that they, can, they think can best serve children. That's it, right? And so, and if we need to adjust our, adjust our elementary model to elementary a 212, model to a or we're getting or some feedback on sound, I don't know if that's, it stopped. So. Um, if whatever adjustments we need to make, we'll adjust that and go from there. But each adjustment or each iteration does not need to be um, rehashed at school committee and reapproved. And so at least that's the guidance that we're getting right now. And so and in regard to your question about transportation, Tom, 
Um, we, we can have some hard numbers in our next meeting to talk about who we're, we, we did kind of an initial registration. And so um, we can kind of collect those numbers and present those next week. And in regard to your first question about technology, it's a great question. I think Kara answered what the survey data said. I think the next kind of level of that for us is verifying the information that has come through on the surveys. For example, does you know 100% of our kids having wireless, what does that mean, right? Does that mean they're using their cell phone as a hotspot to do homework, right? I would argue that that's not what we would want them to do, right? So, um, but it's just verifying and then filling in from there. Um, but there's plenty to do between now and next week. <laughs> I just wrote the list. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, there most certainly is, and I certainly didn't mean here at the last minute as the meeting winding down to, to, to ask more of you. Um, but I certainly uh, very much appreciate everything that the remarks and the presentations that you gave tonight. One thing that comes, uh, uh, you know, glaring um, through, at least for me, was you, you and your team's focus on kids, on students, on safety, on and what what's on best for the education, social and emotional education of the students. Yeah. Um, while certainly things can come around to, to to make improvements with regard to scheduling, convenience for parents, and other things of that. Um, your primacy on um, on education for students and safety um, is very much appreciated, both from my perspective as a committee member and as a parent. So I want to thank you all for the tremendous amount of work that went into what you presented tonight and uh, certainly look forward to whatever input we're going to get over the next week. Our school Thanks. Based, Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for your kind words. You know, uh, we... we um, at the district level need to thank, genuinely thank everyone that participated in our surveys. You know, we do think we're going to need to get out another round of surveys to understand more of what the community will need. Um, we also want to genuinely thank our principals and our reopening teams and the teacher leaders that have spent the last four weeks contributing so thoughtfully um, to the documents that we presented tonight. So thank you. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Yes, sir. As, as much as I'm concerned about all the work you have to do between this week and next week, I'm more concerned with the work you have to do from next week till the beginning of September. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a sense of how prepared you are, whether it's remote or hybrid. Are you feeling okay, or you're real nervous? Are you going to need other things to, to get it done on time? Um. <laughs> So I don't, it is, right? I, so I'm trying to think what's the right answer to that question. Um, thanks, Mike. Thanks. That's, a, that's not a softball to hit. That's right. No, no. We usually end the meeting with a softball, Mike. Someone's got to coach up the new guy. And, and so anyway, um, no, it, it, to, honestly, I, I don't think we're nervous as much as we're really um, eager and excited to get kids back, right? Sure. So when, when kids come back, it changes everything, right? Mm -hmm. Kids come back, it changes everything. Having kids, just 41 kids in our summer program, uh, summer services, and a shortened day, shortened week um, at Woodville has kind of changed um, how people are feeling about the possibility um, to be back. You know, I spoke with Kathy Yuva today, who's working in the summer program, who's been amazing. Um, you know, Bev Elsowitz and, and Tammy are running that program. You know, um, you know these women could run a small country. You know, I mean, they're they're amazing, and and they're they're just. And but what what kind of brings them back, right? Are the kids. It it brings us all back, right? Um, and so you know. Um, so to answer your question, I think we're eager, excited, um, but but we also it's not missed on us that there's a lot of boxes to check. Yeah, right. But in, in but I will say that in looking at the calendar with the ten days that are added to the front of the school year, that gives us more time, right? That gives us more time. And and to be honest, I'm grateful to have it, right? Because if we look at that ten days, we're potentially at, you know. 
the earliest we would have students back, <clears throat> again, we need to kind of work on the calendar, but the earliest we could have students back is the 18th of September. That's the earliest, right? And if we do, if we expand phase two to get, you know, smaller cohorts or smaller groups of students into our schools to meet people, to acclimate before we welcome back larger groups in a hybrid model, um, it, it's, you know, you're probably talking a few weeks after that. So it might be, you know, September 28th or the first week in October. Um, <clears throat> you know, so, so we do have some time, but we are gonna be busy. And, and I will tell you, I, I have no problem saying this, you know, our plan is to address every question that comes across our screen, right? And so we're gonna go through every email and we will address every question. Um, and we will kind of share an FAQ doc and we will come back to this, to this group and report accordingly. Um, and like I said, you know, I said this in our earlier, if, if we can't, if we don't feel something safe or if we feel we can't meet the expectation and safety needs of, of faculty and staff, we're not doing it, right? So, but we are super excited to have kids back. I don't wanna, Kara, I don't know if you have, is that close? Yeah, absolutely, you can have <laughs> <on> everything. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. I think half of the parents on the call just passed out when you said September 28th though. <laughs> yeah. They're hoping it's a lot earlier than that, I'm sure. Well, I think we all are, Mike. I, you know, yeah. I think we all are, but you know, with the, with the 10 days and, and a potentially a modified start, you know, that's, that's the window, right? Like I said, if the earliest is September 18th, you know, that's a Friday. And, uh, you know, the following week we have holidays. There's a lot, a lot happening. September's packed. So more to follow. I don't want to make people more anxious, but thank you for the question. Uh, well, thank you, Doug. And I think if um, I can move on with the agenda, um, just a quick announcement about future dates. Um, our next meeting obviously is uh, scheduled for Wednesday, August 12th at 7.30. Um, and lastly on the agenda, our school committee comments. Um, Chris, would you like to go first? I'm all set. <laughs> Thank you. Mike. I've said enough, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> In the following uh, the, uh, the established a protocol, I'm all set. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Colleen. <coughs> uh, you're on, uh, on mute. <laughs> I feel like I should say I'm all set. Um, <laughs> you guys will forgive me. Um, I, have a, I have a lot to say, but I, I, we have time to say it um, over the course of the next few weeks. But I just wanted to sort of put forth something that um, helps me kind of get through times like these that are tough times. And I've been so inspired not only by my colleagues and this administration, the district, uh, state level conversations that we've all been involved in, um, but really looking to people's creativity, flexibility, perseverance, uh, the pivoting. Um, you see it in restaurants, you see it in corporations, you see it in organizations where people step forward and you know, when you're kind of feeling down and out about these things, I think that you kind of just look to reach to those things to be inspired by, because this is all so daunting. And for me, um, just passing through, you know, whether on social media or you're reading something um, online, it just helps to kind of pull those stories out. And it may seem like common sense. But I think that we can get wrapped up in the, um, the complications of all of this and the fear. But um, you know, working together, I do believe, um, in just looking at our nucleus right here, uh, we work together and we solve problems and we get things done. And I think we do it step by step and then we move to the next step. And I am so inspired by all of you um, each and every time that we meet, I'm learning so much. And um, I just wanted to put that out there. And, that's how, uh, that's how we attempt everything that we do, I think, is just doing the best we can and working together. So I appreciate that and thank all of you. Thank that's you. All. Thank you so much, Colleen. Mm -hmm. Well said. Thank you. Uh, Susie. Um, so I, I, I feel the need to support Mike Boudreaux's kind of comment right there at the end around the 
is that is the phased calendar going to look longer right I, I think Kara you kind of indicated when we went through that schedule that that slide um, that maybe those dates wouldn't look the way that they looked Doug you just said it again I think there there's a lot of angst in the community by working parents of how yeah. are they going to manage this mm -hmm. right and and yet I so support all of the work that you guys have done um, I think hearing about it in more depth tonight just made me feel more confident that it's the right plan. Um, but I also know how very difficult it is going to be for many parents to, mm -hmm. um, to figure out how to manage. Um, and, and, and yet I heard a lot of comments from, from the principals and from you both of we're going to try to be as flexible and we're, you know, we're willing to kind of um, relook at this. But I, I, I think it's... Um, the most important thing for everyone to remember that kids came first in this, mm -hmm. right? Kids and, and, and the, the way that kids need to learn and the best way for kids to learn at each level, which is why every plan is different um, at each level, um, and that safety came next. And safety is really important for student and staff, and that, that has to be at the forefront. And that it could be that they're both on the same. For me, it feels like it's, it's kids first, it's um, safety and it and it is based on feedback from parents mm -hmm. right that the elementary schedule looks the way that it does because elementary parents in the spring said we can't be responsible for teaching our children we're not mm -hmm. elementary school um, teachers and so I just I, I feel like we're in a in a tough position yep. in trying to support those working parents because the the what, what is being proposed will be very difficult for people to manage. Right. Um, and how we ba balance that and how we get back, you know, as quickly as possible while also balancing everything, I just, I feel like we've got to remember that, um, that, that this is going to be difficult for a lot of parents to manage logistically. Right. Um, and how we support that, um, it just needs to also be kind of top of mind. I'm just thinking about our day tomorrow and just how we've set up our weeks and um, tomorrow is, is our day to check in with each of the building um, reopening reps, administrative, administrators at a minimum. And I'm just, you know, between the, I think the emails that we've received already, the feedback we've heard tonight, I think we have a lot of talking points to go in. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and, and that was our point in all of this too. You know, as Doug said, we're putting out a concept, we're putting out what we think um, educationally is best for kids at every level. Um, I think we, we've been in education long enough to know if we push out a general schedule from central office and tell everyone to follow it, it's probably going to fall pretty flat. So we, we really felt it was important to give the buildings, um, the people who know their buildings, they know their students, they know their staff, um, you know, just a, a, a huge role in this to, to tell us what, what really could logistically work. Um, but that's not to say that we don't have more work to do. And I think, you know, like Doug said, we're taking the feedback, we're um, listening to all of the questions and concerns, and we'll, we'll be doing some more troubleshooting tomorrow, I anticipate, in our meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Um, yeah, lastly, I just want to thank you all so much for the, the work, the, all the hard work you've done. I mean, clearly, you and your reopening teams have worked tirelessly. I mean, the presentation tonight was so thorough. Um, and, you know, I really just feel like you're, the, the fact that you're mindful of the student needs, um, parent needs, teachers' concerns, I mean, it's on the forefront. Mm -hmm. So I just appreciate it greatly. Um, you know, and I do think it's a one day at a time at this point because every minute it seems like some, you know, when I talk to you, Doug, from one day to the next, it's the whole story has changed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just, you know, have faith that you and your teams will do what's best, um, but also regrouping, like you said, tomorrow and, you know, engaging parents, which is what you plan to do for the rest of this week. And then obviously reaching out to teachers to make sure you know they're comfortable and, and they can give some insight as well i just think it's an overall team effort and i really appreciate it Thank you. uh so with that do we have a motion to adjourn <laughs> <laughs> uh, move that the school committee adjourn its meeting of august 4th 2020. Second. thank you uh, roll call vote judy yes mr markham yes <laughs> the callanan Ms. Bayer? Yes. Ms. Purcell? Yes. Ms. Guida? Yes. And Mr. Boudreaux? 
Yes. Thank you so much. Um, that adjourns the meeting, and I uh, hope you all have a great night. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.